Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the 8th or last part of What If Deku Were Dead and he reincarnated into a cat. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Hitoshi sighed as he pulled out a giant map of Musutafu that took up a good chunk of the coffee table and grabbed a red marker as everyone surrounded him. Here he circled a small area. This is where we were homeless for a short while. We lived here Hitoshi circled a tiny area where the old school used to be. Moss would frequent here Hitoshi circled a small corner that was just a block away from the school. It once got so bad that they had people guarding the store to stop him. Why exactly is your cat a thief? He's never stolen from us. Ribbit. Sue asked as she put her finger to her chin and tilted her head. Back when we were homeless we were scarce on food. So, he stole from the store because he knew I wouldn't do that. I tried to get him to stop but while homeless he never did. I found out even after we were taken and he'd steal food from the fridge just to make sure Ri and I were well fed. Itoshi explained to them and he looked at the area. Right now we saw in the footage that he's with a lot of other cats. He must be helping them get food. So, we can speculate that he's around here somewhere. Itoshi pointed at the circle with his marker. So, it's going to take all of us to find him because this area is still rather large. We need to find a place where a bunch of cats are. Hello. As the door opened Nenzu spoke, making everyone turn to look at him. In Nenzu's hands was Pumpkin. Followed by Nenzu were all of the foster's cats. The cats let out soft mews and some flocked to the students. Itoshi leaned down and picked up Brat, who came straight to him. Itoshi held Brat carefully and gave her a quick stroke on the head. He then looked at Nenzu. I hope you don't mind me joining in. Nenzu chipperly said as he approached the table. You see I've been having Pumpkin and the other cats scoping out where Moss is currently resting. Nenzu explained and looked at the map. May I? He extended a little paw out for the marker and Hitoshi gave it to him. Nenzu was then picked up by Aizawa, who was standing by watching. He's here. Nenzu circled a small alleyway just three blocks away from the store. The place is heavily guarded by the gang. He said, the cats all have lookouts and if a human comes by the lookouts often either hisses or runs to deter anyone from coming down the dead end where they all rest. Nedzu explained, a gang, your cat joined a gang. Kaminari giggled at the absurdity of it all and it made a few others giggle, Hitoshi included. It is a bit absurd dot 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 but Nenzu, what do you know about the gang outside of it being heavily guarded? Hitoshi inquired as Nenzu was lowered back to the ground. Fifteen cats in total, including Moss. But there's a leader, her name is Muffin. She's smart so be wary of her. Oh, and if a cat is in distress the others will come to their rescue so they're pretty tight-knit. Nenzu explained to Hitoshi. Muffin, that's not exactly an intimidating name. Monoma sat on the edge of the table as he looked down at the map. Pumpkin's ears went back and he gave a mew and Nedzu looked down at the orange cat. Pumpkin then jumped on the table. Pumpkin here says that she means business. Nedzu translated. So, do your best not to harm the other cats. Hitoshi nodded and looked down at the map. Hitoshi. Nedzu stepped up to him and made Hitoshi look at his principal. Moss trusts you. He's keeping his distance because he thinks he's protecting you. So, it has to be you that gets to him. He won't come willingly if anyone else tries to bring him back. Nedzu explained. Ajiro gave a soft noise. Not to sound insensitive but, why don't we just put him in a carrier if that's the case? Because that cat is stupid smart. Bakugo added in before Hitoshi could. Don't forget this cat successfully stole hundreds from a grocery store. We put him in a carrier he's going to find a way out. Hitoshi nodded firmly. Bakugo is right. Not only that but his moss won't be happy if we do that. It's a breach of his trust. No, we need to play this smart. He mused as he looked at the map and then put Brad on the ground. Itoshi quietly tapped the marker against the map a few times as the wheels were turning in his mind. Then he snapped his fingers as the idea hit him. We'll force him to me. H.M. Achako stood on her toes as she looked at the map. What do you mean? We'll chase him down. The other cats are likely to scatter as they're most likely feral. So, here's my idea. Back Hugo he pointed at Back Hugo and made the blonde stand up a little straighter. I want you here he circled the building right at the dead end where the cats were likely to rest. On the roof and you'll wait for a signal and then you'll go down and give chase to the cats forcing them to scatter. HM. Nedzu hummed as he listened to Hitoshi with interest. Now, here's where the rest of you come in. We're going to put you guys into different groups and you're going to be here Hitoshi put an X on one end of the alleyway. And here, he put another X on the second end of the alleyway. If you see Moss rushing for one of those ends block him off by any means necessary because we're going to force him down here he made a line down the straight end of the alley where it met with the street. That's where I'll be waiting on the roof. Hitoshi explained quickly and the others nodded, liking the idea so far. Mind if we help? Aburo and Hizashi walked into the dorms and looked at the map that Hitoshi had created and Hitoshi nodded. That's perfect, actually. 
Papa with your clouds you can lower the visibility so we can stay hidden. The only downfall is our scent. Hitoshi mumbled as he brought his hand up to his chin and thought. I have a connection. Shouta said while stepping up to his husband's. He can mask your scent for a short while. Hitoshi looked at Shouta. If it's not too much trouble. None at all. Shouta then grabbed his phone and walked off to make the call. Hitoshi looked at the plan and it seemed good but it was missing something. We need. Something. He whispered. But what? Fire escapes. Shoto popped up almost out of nowhere. If Moss senses something as a foot he may try and climb the fire escapes to avoid us. You're right I got it. You can ice them so the cats can't use those to get away Shoto shook his head. I didn't get my license, remember? I can't be a part of this otherwise it's unauthorized quirk usage. Damn, you're right. Hitoshi whispered and that's when Monoma came up to Shoto and without a second to think about it he yanked out one of Shoto's hairs. Oh. Shoto whispered and Monoma twirled the hair between his fingers. How's this? Monoma put his hand out and his hand started to ice up as he activated Shoto's quirk. Monoma, I could kiss you. Hitoshi said and it made Monoma blush a little. Well, thank you but I'm not interested. Monoma laughed a little and then he kept Shoto's hair in his palm. I'll keep this on me, since it counts as touching you. Shoto nodded and Hitoshi looked over the plan. This has to work. It has to. He whispered. I'm getting my cat back. May I suggest something? Nedzu asked and Hitoshi nodded. Anything. Izuku lapped at his foot before he dug into his paw pads with his teeth. Then he yanked a piece of glass out of his paw pad. That's been bugging me all day. He whispered before spitting the glass piece out. He lapped his palm with his rough tongue a few times and soon the wound was gone. Ah, did the little baby get glass in his paw pad? Olive teased him as she rubbed up against him. Izuku snorted at the black and white cat before he gently pushed her away from him. I'm fine, he said before stretching himself out and clawing at the ground. As he was stretching he felt eyes on him and before he turned to see who was looking at him Root tackled him. The two of them rolled along the ground in a play fight. Izuku laughed as he and Root gently batted at one another while playing and rolling along the ground. Izuku thought he was winning until he realized he forgot about Rose. Rose came to aid her brother and soon it was two against one as Izuku was fighting a losing battle. Izuku's tail swept side to side as he looked between Root and Rose. Both brown tabbies faced him, their backsides wiggling and their pupils blown wide as they stared at him. Izuku got down low and both cats lunged. Izuku rolled to his side and Root and Rose somehow slammed into each other. Well that took attention off him as both of them started play fighting with each other. Izuku snorted as he watched the siblings play with one another. PSD. Kola rubbed under Izuku's chin as he tried to discreetly talk to him. Izuku should tell Kola what discreet means. Yes. Izuku's nose twitched when Kola's bushy brown tail rubbed under his nose. Can I help you? She likes you. Kola said while stretching himself down low with his rump in the air. Rose that is. Izuku only shook his head. While she seems nice I'm not looking. He told Kola and Kola shrugged. Just thought I'd mention it. Kola added while he bounded off to go and do something else that caught his interest. Izuku smiled a little as he laid down. Then Muffin spoke. Huh, that's weird. She said and Izuku looked at her before realizing she was looking forward and he followed her gaze before he stood up and watched a ridiculously fast mist start to roll in. Izuku and Muffin both flicked their ears back as the mist suddenly rolled on over them and everyone quieted down as the mist settled upon them and made their visibility low. The mist was heavy and made it a little harder to breathe. What on earth? Muffin asked as she sniffed the air. This mist doesn't smell normal. Izuku lifted his head and took a whiff. She was right. It didn't smell like normal mist. It smelled more earthy. Like rain was about to fall which was weird because there wasn't a cloud in the dot 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 sky dot dot dot. The temperature suddenly plummeted and everyone started to look around for the source. Cactus let out a surprise yowl and Izuku could only watch as his outline hit the ground suddenly. Thankfully his drop wasn't harsh in fact it looked like he had slipped. The stairs are slick. Cactus yelled before he rushed to Muffin. What do we do? It's the humans. Muffin said firmly. But I don't smell any humans. Annalie protested. No, Muffin may be right. I wonder if there's a fight or something. Izuku mumbled while flicking his ears wildly around to listen for anything. He could hear scuffling and it sounded like a lot of people were rushing around dot 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 but there was no screaming. No reporters rushing to a fight and more importantly no sound of a fight taking place. Annalie looked nervous as she looked about as all the other cats did. Muffin, Ash whispered nervously as he got closer to her friend. I think we need to leave. Something doesn't feel right. No sooner had the words come out of Ash's mouth had an explosion popped off making all the cats jump, Izuku included. A figure fell from the sky like an angel from the heavens and that person would be none other than Bakugo Katsuki. I found you. Bakugo roared as he used his explosions to keep himself in the air. The loud noise accompanied with the fact that a human had found their way into their safe space sent everyone scrambling. Everyone except Izuku. Izuku felt like he was back in middle school as he just stared at Bakugo as his old friend rushed at him. 
Izuku let out a scared wail when he realized that Bakugo was going to grab him to hurt him like he used to. Well, his wail didn't fall on deaf ears it would seem. Muffin spun around, skidded, and then rushed right at Bakugo. When Muffin jumped and landed directly on Bakugo's head it threw Bakugo off and sent him careening into the nearby wall. It also snapped Izuku back to the present and he wasn't in middle school anymore. Run, Muffin yowled at him as she and Bakugo scuffled with Bakugo trying and failing to get her claws out of his face. Izuku turned and took off. He would go straight down the alley with the others. There would be a cross section coming up and those would lead out. Izuku turned towards the left with Adali. He could see the end coming up. A massive black thing shot out from the opening and it roared at them. Izuku saw dark shadows yellow eyes staring at him before the quirk, like Bakugo, gave chase. Izuku let out a scared yelp and scrambled against the harsh alley floor. He actually had to use his claws to get a grip on the floor and take off running the opposite way with the other cats. What is that thing? Adelie demanded as she kept speed with Izuku. Fell. It happened suddenly. One moment Adelie was with him the next she was gone. By what? Sue's tongue, that's what. The girl had Adelie before she put Adelie in a carrier. Izuku went for the next intersection but skidded to a scrambling stop. Not only was this end of the alley tapped off by Siro's sticky tape, that several of the cats got stuck in and were now being extracted and put into their own carriers by the other students. But the moment Izuku was in their line of sight there was an outcry and several students gave chase with Mina using her acid to start skating along the alley. Izuku, once again, found himself scrambling for safety as a distressed yowl left his mouth. Leave me alone, he cried to Mina and the others as they gave chase to him. It was a literal clash when Mina collided with Dark Shadow and several of them all fell to the ground from the impact and from being forced to stop so suddenly. Bakugo let out a roar as he flew above all of them and used his explosions to propel towards Izuku at a fast rate. Izuku tried to increase his speed, if that was even possible. Bakugo had new cat scratches all over his face and he let out a primal scream. Izuku also let out his own scream as he only saw one more exit. Bakugo was gaining speed, his explosions dissipating the mist and clearing up the chaos that was currently happening. Class 1 was working to collect the gang, several of them fighting with the cats to get them into carriers while Koda was working on trying to get the cats to calm down but obviously couldn't be everywhere at once. Aizawa and Hizashi were part of this with Aburo being on a nearby roof to keep them missed up. Bakugo wasn't letting up and Izuku could feel Bakugo's hand reach for him. His fingers nearly grabbing at Izuku's tail Izuku found his speed and forced himself to go a lot faster in one last adrenaline rush. Izuku could see the light from the end of the alleyway. He could see the street, he could see that nobody was there. I'm almost there. He thought unaware that Bakugo's explosions had ceased. Unaware that everyone was now watching with bated breath. There was a noise about Izuku. It sounded like a bird taking off and he didn't even look. He only had one thing on his mind and that was getting the hell out of Dodge. It was right before he hit the threshold. Right as he was going to jump to freedom did it happen. First there was nobody. Then there was somebody. Izuku was in the air when this person dropped from the sky directly in front of him and scooped him up with ease. Izuku didn't even look at the person as he let out a series of yowls as he tried to claw at this person. To his surprise, even as Izuku drew blood with his claws, even as he bit the person with his sharp fangs, they never let go. No, they tightened their hold on Izuku. Aye, it's okay, it's okay. A voice finally started to ring into Izuku's ears as Izuku kicked and struggled. You're okay, the familiar voice said before it was suddenly dark. Wings engulfed the space and created a barrier between Izuku and the chaos from the outside. You're okay. Izuku sucked in slow breaths as he felt himself slowly look up at Hitoshi. Only, Hitoshi's hair was straight and put up into a high ponytail so it was off of his neck. Hitoshi was smiling as he patted Izuku between the ears and down his spine. Hi, Moss. Hitoshi said in a soft voice. Izuku looked at Hitoshi then at the wings encasing the two of them dot 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 then back at Hitoshi. It's a trick. It has to be Izuku trying to weakly struggle but Hitoshi didn't let go. It's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. Hitoshi whispered before he gently scratched under Izuku's chin. I'm not letting you go. Hitoshi said firmly when Izuku tried again. You don't have to protect me anymore. Izuku. Izuku's fight slowly died as he felt himself relax against Hitoshi's warm embrace. Dot 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 god dot 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 how he missed this. SHH. Hitoshi whispered when Izuku let out a mew. We're going to work this out together. I promise. But we can't do that if you stay away. Hitoshi kept Izuku firm against his chest. It's going to be okay. He promised in a soft whisper, it's going to be okay. He reassured Izuku and Izuku. Izuku could only believe him and he let out a soft mew. I know. Itoshi lowered the wings his wings. But we have help. Don't forget that. And he held Izuku up straight with his hand firmly under Izuku's rump so Izuku could see just what was happening. Yes, Wano was putting cats away in carriers. But it was clear now that Aburo had stopped misting the place up, that the cats were actually being put in carriers for their own safety. 
Everyone was done and all were staring at Moss and Hitoshi. See, they're all here to help. Hitoshi told Izuku as, We're all going to get through this, but we need you, Moss. You're central and you're not at fault for Nai's finding me. There's just no way. Hitoshi whispered and held Moss up by his underarms so they were now facing each other. You were a core part of my rescue. If not for you I don't know where I'd be right now. Hitoshi then smiled. So please, come home. Izuku stared at Hitoshi for several long seconds and Hitoshi stared back, neither of them making a move. Then, Izuku wiggled a little and Hitoshi slacked up his grip. Izuku then jumped on Hitoshi's shoulder and rubbed his face against his friend and Hitoshi grinned at this. God, you reek. Hitoshi joked but still did wince when he got a whiff of Izuku's fur. Izuku twitched his nose and then licked Hitoshi's cheek. Then there was a yowl. Nobody captured Muffin. Muffin was gunning for Hitoshi. Her yowl of uncoming told Izuku all he needed to know that Muffin thought Hitoshi was going to hurt him. Izuku leaped from Hitoshi's shoulder and got in front of Muffin quickly. He blocked all of her attempts but didn't fight her himself. Muffin, it's okay, it's okay. Izuku told her gently as he then grabbed her from her scruff and both of them tumbled to the ground. It's okay, Izuku, they have the gang. It's okay, Izuku yelled again this time a little louder. Muffin, this is Hitoshi, my owner. This is his class and his parents. They're just trying to protect us. Look, Izuku urged her to look towards the others and she did. The children were already starting to let the cats out. They were only putting them in carriers to stop us all from scattering and getting lost. Muffin's ears went back as she watched as one by one the carriers were being opened. But dot 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 why? Because it was never their intention to harm us. They dot 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 they want me back home, Muffin. Muffin blinked and then looked at him. So they did all of this just to get you back. She asked him softly and Izuku nodded slowly. I need to be back with them. He whispered to her. I hope you understand. Muffin looked at him before she straightened herself up and then gave herself a firm shake. Well, if they went through all of this, I guess I have no choice but to let you go. She told him matter-of-factly before she turned and laughed at her fur. You're more trouble than you're worth, housecat. She teased him and he laughed a little. Perhaps so. He bowed his head to her. Thank you for all you've done. And thank you. You've helped our gang, now go. Muffin ordered while gesturing towards Satoshi with her head. Before they do something crazy again and dot 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 if you ever need anything. You know where to find me, Cloud. Cloud, I never told you. That's what our mother named you before you turned green. Izuku blinked at Muffin's words. Then she named you Smog, but I like Cloud better. Actually, out of all the names I've had, I prefer Moss. Moss, it suits you, better than Smog anyways and it's much better than Izuku. Muffin laughed a little before she turned and padded away. See you around, Moss. See you. Izuku then turned towards Hitoshi. Hitoshi opened his arms wide and Izuku didn't hesitate. He jumped right into them and Hitoshi held him close with a smile. I'm never going to let you go. Hitoshi promised in a soft whisper and Izuku rested his head against Hitoshi's chest before he put a paw up and gently grasped Hitoshi's hero costume. Izuku looked up at Hitoshi and Hitoshi smiled. That's a promise. Izuku floated on his back in the shared bath that all the boys were having. The water was nice against his fur and the others didn't mind when Hitoshi shampooed Izuku down with cat shampoo. There was a small issue when fleas jumped from Izuku but seeing how the tub would be drained it wasn't too much of an issue. Soon, Izuku was dried and boy did his fur puff out after he was blow dried by Ayama. But before he knew it after all was said and done he was being tucked into bed with Hitoshi. Izuku had questions he couldn't ask and Hitoshi knew this. Not tonight, he said as he put Izuku into bed. Tomorrow, I'll explain everything, but tonight, tonight we rest. We both need a rest and you've had a day. Hitoshi then put the blanket over Izuku but kept Izuku's head out of the blanket. Izuku snuggled close to Hitoshi and Hitoshi relaxed. Sleep was instant for the both of them as they were both finally reconnected. At some point in the night, Izuku woke up to Hitoshi throwing an arm over him and pulling him in. Izuku blinked at this before smiling to himself and resting his head on Hitoshi's hand. Good night, Hitoshi. Izuku mewed softly and then fell into a deep and relaxing sleep. He was back in here to stay by Hitoshi's side for as long as possible. True to his words, Hitoshi sat Izuku down and explained what happened in the two months Izuku had been gone. He explained how his quirk was gone, something Izuku already knew thanks to Nyes, and he explained how his wings came to be, how he had to be heavily sedated by midnight because the wings were going to burst from his back, how he had to learn how to use this new quirk and how he learned they really just allowed him to fly. Nothing like hawk's wings outside of the feathers growing back once lost. And he was okay with that. Izuku felt bad for not being there when Hitoshi obviously needed him. But it was something he felt he had to do to keep Hitoshi and the others safe and the sad thing was that Izuku couldn't even tell Hitoshi this because the mind link was gone now by commandeered by Nice. Still, Hitoshi held on to Izuku after it was all said and done and he held his friend close to his chest. 
You've gotten so big. Itoshi whispered softly while he gently scratched behind Izuku's ears and the sides of his face. This made Izuku purr and shut his eyes. I remember the day you saved me. You were just a baby kitten, and now you're easily 10 or 15 pounds and a third of my size. Itoshi smiled down at Izuku. Itoshi then picked Izuku up and laid down on his back. He had Izuku over his face and in the air. Izuku looked down at Itoshi and Itoshi looked up at him. We're going to get past this, buddy. Itoshi whispered. We got over all the speed bumps in the past and we're going to get over this now. Izuku gave another purr and put his now rough paw pad on Itoshi's nose. The pad that was once soft and smooth was now rough. When Itoshi felt that a light bulb went off over his head. Come on, it's the weekend and I got an idea. Itoshi picked Izuku up and held him like a suitcase as he went for his door. I wonder what's on his mind. Izuku wondered in his thoughts, wishing he could ask Hitoshi. All he could do was let out a soft mew as Hitoshi walked out of his dorm room. Izuku had no idea where they were going. Well, he would learn it was out of the dorms as Hitoshi walked down to the common room, said hello to some of his classmates, and then put his shoes on at the door. Then he left. Outside it was cloudy out and the clouds were a dark gray, almost black, signaling that rain was going to happen soon. Hitoshi hurried for the apartments. Izuku just looked at everything before he wiggled a bit and gave a mew. Though, Itoshi stopped and put Izuku on the ground. Izuku stopped and got down low, wiggling his butt a bit as he did this. Itoshi understood and got low with his arm extended out. Izuku jumped up and took his place on Hitoshi's shoulders. Izuku, however, kept his eyes on Hitoshi's new wings. The wings reminded Izuku of a Dalmatian, white with black spots, but these spots were uniformed as is for a snowy owl. Still, as Hitoshi walked the wings moved gently with each movement. Izuku looked at the feathers and how they swayed with each little movement. His feathers were overlaid on top of one another. Izuku couldn't help himself. He slowly raised a paw up, thought about it, and brought his paw down on one of the feathers. Hey, Hitoshi called. I can feel that. He laughed a little while he turned to look back at Izuku. Izuku looked at him, flicked his ears, and then looked back down at the feathers again. He just watched them move completely entranced. They would make it to the apartments and Hitoshi went straight for the fosters. He opened the door and immediately there were wails from all the other cats once they saw Izuku. Moss. Brian yelled enthusiastically as he rubbed against Hitoshi's legs. Mossy. Brat hopped onto the couch and let out a bit of a wail upon seeing him. Jelly and Tinnitum both took the same route as Brian and rubbed against Hitoshi's legs like he had a treat to give them. Move. Pumpkin bowled over Brian and with no warn jumped on Hitoshi's shoulders. Whoa. Hitoshi yelled in alarm as he nearly toppled over at Pumpkin's sudden weight on his shoulders. Thankfully, Hitoshi managed to keep his footing. The same couldn't be said for Izuku because before he knew it Pumpkin was all over him, rubbing himself all over Izuku and successfully throwing him off of Hitoshi. Izuku let out a yelp when he hit the ground but the moment he was on the ground all of the cats rubbed against him, all of them crying at his great return from being gone for two months. Hey, came Aburo's jovial voice. Aburo came up and hugged Hitoshi and then laughed at the current pile of cats all laying on top of Izuku. Izuku didn't feel too amused but the others were happy to say the least. They were all purring as they tried to get Izuku to smell like them again and not like the gang. Aburo came up to Hitoshi and gave him a hug and Hitoshi returned it. What brings you two here today? Aburo's eyes went from Hitoshi to Izuku before he very quickly turned his gaze back to his son. Aburo was very much aware of the fact that Izuku heard them talking about getting rid of him. Hitoshi leaned down and picked Moss up from the cat pile. Izuku gave a mew as he was then hoisted up and held against Hitoshi's chest with Hitoshi keeping a hand firmly under Izuku's bum. I'm gonna spoil, Izuku. Hitoshi said matter-of-factly. Come again. Izuku blinked before looking up at Hitoshi. Is that so? And how exactly? Aburo put both of his hands on his hips as he asked this with a smile playing on his lips. With a spa day. I know you guys have all sorts of cat products like the paw pad bomb and whatnot and I figured why not put them to use. Aburo chuckled at that. Yeah that is true. We buy this stuff and then never use them because the cats usually don't like it. But maybe moss will be different. Have at it. But clean up your mess. He said before quickly leaving. It was clear, at least to Izuku. Aburo was more than a little awkward around Izuku for the time being. Izuku just let it go as he was now being put in the bathroom. Itoshi collected all the products that the other cat products. Of course this garnered Iri's attention and immediately his little sister wanted to join in. He allowed it. Then came the pampering. Izuku wasn't entirely sure this wasn't a ploy by Hitoshi to make sure Izuku stays. Izuku got his ears cleaned out by Hitoshi he was using some sort of finger sleeve made of cotton. It felt amazing. Then Iri was spreading a sort of bomb across Izuku's paw pads, almost like a massage. The palm was to heal cracking and rough paw pads, like the pads Izuku garnered from being with the gang. It felt greasy but great at the same time. Iri was gentle as she finished up and she smiled at Izuku, who's a good boy. Iri inquired as she gently scratched under Izuku's chin. 
Pumpkin decided he wanted to join too as he put both of his paws under the closed door and started to meow. The three of them watched as Pumpkin slowly moved his paws around like he was trying to find something. He moved them up against the wall and patted around before he found what he was looking for. With his claws he grabbed onto the springy doorstop, pulled it back, and then just let it go. Thumb bum bum bum. They all just continued to watch as he did it again. Thumb bum bum bum. Then the siblings just looked at one another and smiled as something passed between them telepathically. Yuri got up and opened the door. Finally, Pumpkin huffed at her as he sauntered in the room. Mother what he was then grabbed by Hitoshi. Got him. Hitoshi called and then got on his knees and presented Pumpkin's stomach to Yuri. Yuri was quick as she uncapped the paw pad bomb and started to smear the greasy substance all over Pumpkin's paws. Ew. No. Pumpkin jerked his paws away from her and let out meows as it was clear he wasn't enjoying this. Izuku gave a little laugh as Yuri grabbed his hind foot and started to smear the stuff all over his paws to try and help his rough paw pads. It's good for you. Pumpkin, Izuku told him as he patted up to Pumpkin. It feels gross. Get it off. Pumpkin started to thrash and Hitoshi laughed a little but kept the grip on him strong, strong but not tight. Izuku just sighed and pressed his head against Pumpkin's face. Let them do this. It's a spa day. Pumpkin's struggle died a bit but didn't completely fade. A what day? He demanded. A spa day. They're pampering us because they want to and because I think they're just a little bored. So, let them do this. Pumpkin huffed at Izuku's request but he did finally allow Iri to smear and massage in the pad bomb on his other two paws. There's a good kitty. Itoshi put on another finger sleeve. Warning he's going to stick his finger in your ear. Don't panic. He's just cleaning out the wax. Izuku warned Pumpkin as Hitoshi started to move to clean out Pumpkin's ear. No, no. Don't Pumpkin couldn't stop it as Hitoshi put his finger on the inside of his ear and started to move it around. This is humiliating. Pumpkin grumbled bitterly as this went down. Izuku chuckled as he lay next to Pumpkin. Hey, they get the things we can't reach. Gross. When's the last time your ears have been cleaned? Hitoshi showed Izuku the cotton sleeve and it came back a gross yellow as buildup was evident. Pumpkin harumphed at this as his ears went back. That didn't stop Hitoshi from grabbing a new sleeve and going for the next ear. Click. Everyone slowly turned towards Aburo who had his phone out and was taking pictures. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Shouta and Hazashi wouldn't believe me if I told them that you got Pumpkin to sit still for something. Aburo then locked eyes with Izuku before quickly scurrying away. This time it was Izuku's ears that went back as he snorted. Very leaned into Hitoshi and motioned for him to come down so she could whisper in his ear. He did. She whispered softly but Izuku as well as Pumpkin could both still hear her clear as day. I still have that onesie. What's a onesie? Pumpkin inquired and Izuku saw both of them grinning down at Pumpkin. He was going to find out soon enough when Hitoshi picked him up and walked out the door with Iri in tow. Izuku watched this and shook his head. Still, as much as he would love to, he didn't follow instead he walked to the threshold and turned towards the kitchen. Izuku sighed and padded towards Aburo. Aburo was making himself scarce in the kitchen. He was watching the tea kettle quietly waiting for the water to boil. Izuku padded up behind the man and it was clear that Aburo didn't even see him. There was a silence before Izuku backed up a bit, got low, wiggled his butt a few times as he thought about how he was going to do this, and then he charged. He ran and jumped high, so high that he was able to land just below Aburo's shoulder. Whoa, Aburo gasped in shock as he took a few steps back and regained his balance. Izuku climbed up the rest of the way with ease. Soon, he was perched on Aburo's shoulder. Aburo looked at him and Izuku simply lapped at his paw a few times before swiping it over his ears to get them clean. Look, Aburo sighed and then grabbed Izuku with one hand before he held him up with both of his hands. I know you were outside the hospital door the night we got Hitoshi back. I know you heard everything I said and... I'm sorry, I was irrational and upset, I'm sure you saw that. Izuku only nodded softly and Aburo sighed again. Seeing Hitoshi like that, seeing him comatose with his eyes wide open dot 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 it scared me. I was afraid of losing him and I just, I just thought because of the connection you and Nice have. I'm sorry, Izuku. Aburo was gentle as he moved Izuku down and then cradled him against the crook of his arm. I never should have suggested getting rid of you like you were just an unruly animal whom we couldn't train. It was unfair and unjust on my part. You never should have thought that you were better alone than back with us. We'll always love you and you're always welcome in this household. Aburo rubbed his cheek against Izuku's face and Izuku gave a weak purr in response as he felt his emotions well up a bit. Am I forgiven? Aburo inquired and Izuku gave a simple nod. This made Aburo smile. There was a sudden yowl that made both of them turn their heads just in time to see Pumpkin come crashing towards them. His footing off balanced by the onesie he was put into. Pumpkin scrambled against the floor and Aburo couldn't help it he let out a barking laugh and it was echoed by Aries and Hitoshi's own laughter from down the hall. I got to get a picture of this. Aburo laughed as he gently put Izuku down and went to take his camera out. Pumpkin would not hold still as he continued to scramble against the linoleum floor to the best of his ability. Get this thing off of me. 
Get it off. Pumpkin demanded as he tried to get his footing but it wasn't coming. He slipped all over the place as he ran at top speed. This caused the other cats to come and watch this chaos unfold. It was like trying to grab a greased up pig. Despite Pumpkin demanding this thing come off he would let anyone grab him. He ran between Hitoshi's legs and around her with slippery stealth. It was Aburo that finally caught him by encasing him in a cloud. Aburo was chuckling so hard that he had tears in his eyes and was still giggling while he snapped that photo, no doubt to send to the other fosters. Then when that was over and done with he managed to take a struggling pumpkin out of the onesie. Once he was released from his clothing prison, Pumpkin jumped to the ground and shook himself off. That's the last time I let you talk me into doing something. He grumbled before licking himself. Izuku let out a laugh and just let Pumpkin storm off. Brian came up to Izuku and Izuku looked at him before smiling. It's good to have you back, Moss. Brian pressed against him and Izuku returned the press in full. I won't lie, it's good to be back. Izuku whispered in return and he meant it. He had no idea how much he missed this family until he was away for so long. Brat suddenly barreled into him and before he knew it the two of them were play fighting. When the time came to return to school Izuku was vested up and sitting where he belonged, right on Hitoshi's shoulder. Hitoshi was in a skirt today, along with a crisp new shirt and blazer. Apparently, all of his shirts had to be new because of the wings on his back, which made sense, and was wearing his boots, in an outfit Izuku hadn't seen for a while. Everyone missed him as he received pats from Wano when they went to the common room. Dark Shadow held him close and yoinked him off of Hitoshi's shoulder. I didn't mean to scare you. Dark Shadow whined while they gently patted Izuku's head. It's okay. Izuku responded but he knew the quirk couldn't understand him. Dark Shadow would return Izuku to Hitoshi's shoulder when Takoyami called her back. Then, it was back to class. And dot 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 well dot 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 something interesting happened on the way to class. Hitoshi was at his locker to collect his belongings when someone bumped into him purposefully. Hitoshi snorted at the person. So, I guess we should start calling you Hedwig now. The person, someone from business class, had asked as he leaned down in a fashion that one would call intimidating. If they were taller than Hitoshi that was, but they weren't. They were shorter than him. Izuku was sure it was the boots that gave Hitoshi the height advantage. Call me whatever, I don't know you hey. Then the prick suddenly grabbed one of Hitoshi's wings and yanked on it. These don't look impressive, you hawks wannabe. But from what I heard it's an upgrade from your previous quirk. Izuku let out a hiss as he got ready to lunge. Truthfully he was ready to attack when the ass grabbed Hitoshi's wing the way he had. But his comment was just the final straw. However, it never escalated to that. It happened so fast that Izuku hardly had time to register it. Bakugo, who hadn't been far away, had grabbed one of his textbooks and struck the business class kid upside the face with it. The kid's head whipped to the side before his face struck the lockers and his knees nearly gave out. Don't be a prick. Bakugo roared at the kid. A hand grabbed the kid's wrist and held it tightly, so tightly that it undoubtedly caused the bones to click together judging by the kid's painful face as he looked at Monoma. Don't you know better than to touch others without permission? Monoma demanded with his eyes unyielding. You act like I asked for my quirk to be taken. Hitoshi hissed as he then looked at the boy and the boy's eyes narrowed. With a quirk like the one you had, I would have. That was all he had to say before he yanked his hand out of Monoma's grip before he bumped past Hitoshi. How you're still in the hero course, I don't know. Oh wait, I do know. You're the son of your teacher. Must be nice. My brother was expelled for doing less by your father. Was his last words before he walked on. Ass. Bakugo growled a bit as he, and the others, watched the prick go. It's fine. Itoshi huffed. They're upset and afraid and I don't really blame them all that much. Still, he shouldn't get away with talking to you like that. Monoma grumbled while they finally collected their things and power walked toward class. True, but let them. I think you can both agree. I faced worse. That was the unfortunate truth. Still, Hitoshi could only hold his head up and try to smile. He and Izuku both. Bonus. Inko didn't want to believe it. What Shino Monoma had told her was absurd but when Shino showed her pictures of her father, there was no denying it. That was Hisashi, the man she fell in love with all those years ago. But that would make him old. Yet, Hisashi didn't look like he aged a single day. It was insane. So insane that Inko had told Shino to leave and never come back but yet here they both were weeks later staring at one another per Inko's own request. Shino sipped her tea as Inko looked at the table. Steven sat next to Inko looking just as baffled as she was. Why did you tell me this? Inko finally asked as she looked at Steven and Steven only nodded as he was wondering the same thing. Why tell someone this? Truthfully Shino put her teacup down and then put her hands in her lap. Because I feel like you need to know the truth the truth that my own son told me not long ago. Inko are you aware of what happened to Izuku's body? At the mention of Izuku's name, Inko teared up. Just thought a villain took it. She whispered and Steven grabbed her hand. Shino sighed softly and then swallowed an obvious lump in her throat. Inko not just any villain stole his corpse. It was him. 
My father, your husband, buds in America. Of course, that wasn't the truth. Inko knew this for a long long time now. It was something she told Izuku when he wondered where his loving father had vanished to. Inko Shino's tone was almost pity when she spoke Inko's name. You and I both know that's not true. But why? Why would he take Izuku's corpse when he didn't care about Izuku? It's clear he didn't care about him because Hisashi left. Inko's voice rose so high that several wards gave her warning glances and one even stepped up. Shino put a hand up to stop him from taking Inko out of the situation. Inko I never told this to anyone. Not even my husband, but as I told you, my father tried to kill me when I was 16. I wasn't what he wanted from a child. My father planned on making me into something. Something he called a Namu. To put my weak quirk to use. As he said, Shino looked down at her lap her eyes going far away for a moment before she came back to the present just seconds later. My father wanted to use my quirk for his own personal use. But Izuku was quirkless. Inko stood up quickly as she yelled this so loud that it made other conversations stop. He didn't have a quirk. It's the reason he committed suicide in the first place. Shino lowered her head. I don't claim to know everything I'm sorry, but I know what my son told me. My son knows that there's a Namu out there claiming to be Izuku Midori. A Namu then her eyes went from Inko and over to Kikayo who was obviously listening in. That attacked your son, Akiko Shinsu. Oh yes, I know exactly who you are. Kikayo's eyes narrowed as she put her plastic fork upwards. I will stab you. She hissed to Shino darkly. Shino was unfazed as she turned back to Inko then she turned her attention to Rei. Rei was sitting at the table next to theirs. She was at making it look like she was eating and not listening in. Your son is also in my son's class. Perhaps you should pay attention as well. Rei looked up and then put her fork down. While I won't stab you, I should let you know who my husband is and the fact that I also have a hero's license. You're freaking everyone out and we don't much like it. I'm warning you all. This thing, this Namu, it has Izuku's memories and it won't be long before it comes here. Why? And Ko whispered and Steven gently patted her hand as she sat back down. Why Izuku is all I'm asking. Why can't he just rest? While I don't know why he chose your son, I do know this. This thing, this nice, as my son called him, is growing more and more intelligent by the day and I just want to be sure that you're all protected because she now turned to Kikayo. He managed to kidnap Hitoshi right from under UAS nose Kikayo stood quickly but Shino put her hand up. He's been found and he's alive. That being said, it's only a matter of time before Nice finds you and you. Shino looked at Inko and then Kikayo respectfully. To try and get to Hitoshi or Hitoshi's cat. His cat. Kikayo inquired and Inko's mind flashed to that green cat. The cat with those familiar green eyes. Nito hasn't gone into detail on why this Nama wants a cat. But yes there was something about Shino's voice. Something that told Inko she was holding information back. Like she knew something but didn't want to tell. So please, I just want you all to be prepared should the Namu come this way. Please heed my words, Inko, he is not your son. Not anymore. Izuku sat on Bakugo's shoulders. The blonde was clearly irritated by his brand new and unwanted 15-pound scarf, but said nothing about it outside of don't you have an owner to bug. While the two of them sat in the common room, Itoshi is busy. Izuku mewed despite knowing that Bakugo couldn't understand him. Itoshi was busy sparring with Takoyami. Though it was a little strange, Takoyami grabbed Hitoshi quickly by the arm and told him to come sparring, which was very un -Takoyami like Still in their sudden haste they left Izuku behind and now here he was. Here Bakugo shoved something in front of Izuku's face and Izuku noticed it as a chicken nugget. Izuku took the nugget happily and munched on it with a purr. Yeah, yeah, you spoiled flea back. Bakugo grumbled before he reached up and scratched Izuku behind the ear before returning to his study. Izuku got up and stretched on Bakugo's shoulders before he then jumped down. He was starting to grow restless and was sure Bakugo wanted to be alone. Bakugo stretched his neck from side to side before groaning. God, you're fat. I'm not fat. Izuku hissed and Bakugo rolled his eyes. Deny it all you want. Izuku's ears went back but then he turned and walked away. Good, you need the walk. Izuku spun and hissed again. This made Bakugo smirk a little. Izuku felt himself bristle before he snorted and turned away. He had better things to do. Izuku swayed his tail from side to side and then walked to find something to do. Well, he didn't have to go far when the doors opened and in came Vlad. You, Vlad hissed and Izuku promptly turned to walk away from him. Oh no you don't. Izuku let out a meow of protest when he grabbed by the middle. He tried to struggle against Vlad but the man refused to let go. If anything he tightened his grip on Izuku as he held him like a suitcase under his arm. Izuku even resorted to biting Vlad's arm, but Vlad hardly flinched. Instead the man just kept on walking without a care in the world. They walked out of the dorms and into the apartments with ease. Put me down. Izuku deadpanned but his mewing fell on deaf ears. Vlad then opened his apartment door, slammed it, and then marched Izuku into the kitchen. The kitchen where Fairy lay on a blanket. Several kittens five to be exact clearly newly born. 
While none of them are green, I still need to ask, are they yours? Each kitten was black and white. Of course their black and white nature looked unique to each kitten, but it's very clear to Izuku that they were sired by a black and white cat. Izuku just looked at Vlad and he didn't need to speak as he just gave Vlad a look saying, Are you for real? Izuku just sighed, turned, and left the apartment. Yeah, he wasn't doing anything right now, but he didn't have time for baseless accusations. Vlad just watched him go with a huff. Yeah, well, stay away from Fairy. Slam, Izuku let out a yelp when the door hit him on the way out. He looked back at the door with a glare before sitting there in the hallway. He thought about what he wanted to do. It was such a peaceful day that he wasn't sure. I wonder if Hitoshi is done with Takoyami. Izuku mused out loud. He got up before stretching his back out and putting his hide in the air. Izuku grunted and then stretched out his hind legs and then splutted and dragged his hind legs along the ground for a few seconds. Once he stood up straight, he looked around and then decided to just leave and see if Hitoshi was done. Hitoshi ran his hand down his face as he looked at Fumikage with wide eyes. Are you sure? He whispered, almost wanting Takoyami to repeat himself again. Fumikage nodded slowly. Absolutely. Hitoshi let out a soft breath. We can't go to the teachers without proof. He paced around while gently tapping his fists on top of one another while he thought about what Fumikage had told him. Otherwise, it's baseless. Itoshi bit his lip and looked at the gym ceiling. For a moment he's silent again while staying pensive in his thoughts. Maybe I should ask Tenko if he knows anything. You believe me, don't you? Fumikage asked and Itoshi nodded. Aye. I do. You're not the type to make up something like this. Not only that but with the way you pulled me in here it's clear that you just want to be safe. Both boys clammed up when the door to the gym opened. Thankfully, it was only Moss, Hitoshi's cat, who jumped up and used his weight to turn the handle and allow gravity to swing the door open. Moss looked at Hitoshi and Takoyami and tilted his head to the side before jumping from the handle and walking up to the both of them. The door slammed shut once Moss made it to them. Fumikage looked at Hitoshi and gave his own head a subtle shake. It was clear what he was saying, at least to Hitoshi. Not here. Hitoshi understood and then looked at Moss. Hey, buddy, he put on a smile and then leaned down and picked Moss up. Moss hopped onto his shoulders and then rested there like a scarf. You came just in time. Fumikage and I have just finished up. Hitoshi lied. Truthfully they never began. Moss raised his head and looked at Hitoshi and if he had an eyebrow Hitoshi was sure it would be raised. Despite the mind link being lost, Hitoshi could hear Izuku loud and clear. Fumikage, thanks again, Fumi. I will dot 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 heed your advice. Hitoshi said, hoping he didn't sound too stiff. I hope you do and uh, be careful with daggers of course. I will. Hitoshi then quickly walked to the door, nearly running into it in his haste. Hitoshi then grabbed Izuku once he was outside, the hot summer air hitting his skin. We have a problem. Hitoshi whispered to Izuku in a very soft and subtle voice as he hurried across the grounds. Hitoshi walked past Jiro and immediately shut his mouth. Jiro said nothing as they passed one another and Hitoshi kept walking until he heard Jiro speak. Hey, he didn't turn and neither did she. The two of them just stood with their backs to one another easily ten or so feet apart. Yes, Moss picked up on the growing tension easily as he looked at Hitoshi. I don't know if I ever said this but, I like your wings, but they don't suit you. Is that so? Hitoshi asked while looking at her out of the corner of his eye. I, I have to agree with you. They aren't exactly mine. He swallowed his throat going dry. Right. Regardless, I'm glad you're getting used to them. And you, how are you holding up without a quirk? As good as I could be, I guess. Anyways, I have to go. I need to work on my sparring. Hitoshi only nodded and started to walk away without a goodbye. Izuku watched Jiro go before looking at Hitoshi. Hitoshi bypassed the dorms entirely and instead went for the other dorms, the one owned by those being reformed. Hitoshi was quiet as he opened the door. What wasn't quiet was the reformed dorm. There was a scream of bloody murder and they walked right as Toga tackled Tenko to the ground and looked like she was ready to stab him with a pair of scissors. Itoshi and Izuku both just watched as this was happening with Tenko having his half-gloved hands on Toga's wrists to keep her from stabbing him. Dabai was watching this happen with a cup of coffee in his hands, two new piercings on his face, those being a pair of snake bites hoops against his lips. Twice was both cheering for Toga and also screaming in fear for Tenko. Get him Toga. Don't hurt him. Slowly everyone stopped and turned towards Hitoshi and Moss. Hey, Toshi. Toga jumped off of Tenko and ran up to Hitoshi giving him a hug around the middle. You look cute, she said while looking at Hitoshi's skirt. She put her hands into face with a smile. You know, I could help dye your hair. You'd look amazing as a blonde. I'll think about it. Hitoshi smiled at her before patting her shoulder and then walking up to Tenko. Hey, I have a question. Hitoshi then squatted down so he was at least near Tenko's head. Erg. What? Tenko grunted and Hitoshi noted that he sounded a little out of breath while he stayed on the floor staring at the ceiling. I'm very busy, don't you know? So make it quick. Yes, you certainly look busy getting stabbed. Is there a traitor in UA? And if so why don't tell anyone? 
Tenko's red eyes didn't waver as he stared at Hitoshi and Moss for several long seconds. Hitoshi didn't speak. He didn't even move as he waited for Tenko's response. There was then a sigh from Tenko. I always knew there was a traitor amongst Yue. The issue is even I don't know who it could be. They could be from your class or they could be from the general education class. There better not be. Anybody who made Hitoshi and Jiru quirkless is getting a knife to the eye. Especially if they're in Gen Ed. Bunch of jealous. Toga. Hitoshi snapped his fingers to get her attention back on the subject at hand. He then focused back on Tenko. Tenko, you haven't spoken to them at all. They were only allowed contact through father all for one, I mean. He would tell them where to be and what was happening. It would have been too risky for too many calls to be placed back and forth between all for one, myself, and the traitor. Fair. Hitoshi thought. Do you know who it is? Is that why you're asking? Dabai crossed his arms over his chest as he asked this. I have an inkling, but I don't want to say it. I don't want a witch hunt on the off chance we're wrong about this. Hitoshi mumbled and stood from his squat. Moss looked at Hitoshi and just flicked his ear a bit. I know I should go to Nenzu about this but I don't want to be wrong. It's such a big accusation he sighed and put his hand to his cheek as he thought about it. Do you at least know their gender? If they have one, of course. Tenko shook his head. Afraid not, Lavender. Tenko said sadly. I was told nothing about them. Master told me not to worry about it. Hitoshi's phone dinged and he reached to grab it out of his back pocket. Izuku watched as Hitoshi took one look at the message before his eyes went wide. I gotta go. He yelled before twisting his heel and running out of the dorms with Izuku still in his arms. Wait Toga called but Hitoshi didn't listen as he kept going. Hitoshi looked at Izuku and then stopped and put his cat down. Go get dad. All of them, lead them to gym gamma. Hurry, Moss. Hitoshi yelled to his friend while he kept running to the gym. Takoyami is in danger. His phone was still in his hand, the message fresh in his mind. Ebony darkness, they know I know, come to the gym quickly. Damn it, I knew I shouldn't have left him when I did. Hitoshi thought in his growing worry. Unfurling his wings he jumped and took off into the air to get to the gym faster. The gym really wasn't even all that far. But that didn't stop Hitoshi from going full speed, so fast that his hair tail nearly slipped out of his hair as he saw the facility coming up. Hitoshi landed on the ground and rolled, doing a complete somersault, but didn't stop running. He sprung up at high speed and threw the gym doors open. Fumikage. The gym was dark. All the lights turned out leaving the gym swallowed by darkness. Silence. Dead silence. The silence that gave away Hitoshi's attacker when he heard them shuffle from behind. Hitoshi spun just in time to see the glint of a knife aiming to stab him in the back. Hitoshi was quick as he grabbed their wrist and twisted it to try and get them to let the knife go. Well, Hitoshi was rewarded with a fist to the side of the head. He saw stars, stars that danced around his vision and swam in all types of directions. Hitoshi was then kneed directly in the groin, sending him straight to his knees with a yelp. You may dress like a girl, but you still have the same weakness that every boy has. The tip of the knife was placed under his chin and he was forced to look up into angry black eyes. Gyro's angry black eyes to be more exact. Hitoshi sucked in several deep breaths and tried to stand. But Gyro grabbed the back of his ponytail and forced his head back to expose his neck. I wouldn't. She warned him. This wasn't how things were supposed to play out, you know. You getting caught because you were talking to Nyes and Dark Shadow heard you through the vents. Well dot 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 yes, but I also mean these she let go of Hitoshi's hair for a moment just to grab onto one of his wings. These were supposed to be mine. She hissed to him between clenched teeth. But Nyes decided last minute that the wings should be yours. We were both supposed to get our quirks swapped out. But in the end you got the quirk I was supposed to receive. You knew we were going to be taken that night at the camp. It wasn't a question but a statement and Gyro laughed a mirthless laugh. I did. Granted I didn't expect to actually be paired with you. That was just a bonus. She kept the knife pressed against Hitoshi's Adam's apple and Hitoshi swallowed hard. What did you do to Fumikage? Fumikage. I thought it was just a slip of the tongue on your part but you're actually that close with him. She said with a bit of a sinister smile on her face. I have to say, it's about time but it's also a little too late, I'm afraid. With how much it was clear he had a crush on you. What? But you never seemed to return his feelings. Only now he became Fumikage. He had a crush on me. That can't be right. Right? Itoshi's mind flashed to nearly every interaction he had with Fumikage leading up to this moment in time. How Fumikage showed up to his house after the USJ attack. Fumikage immediately migrating into Hitoshi's friend group despite clearly preferring being a loner. How protective Fumikage became of Hitoshi. Fumikage helping Hitoshi after Hitoshi had his mental break and then again when Hitoshi's wings started to sprout. Fumikage's little gifts. Gifts. Wait a minute. Hitoshi thought of those random pebbles he'd find around. Those pretty pebbles that looked like they belonged in an aquarium. Don't. Don't birds present pebbles to potential mates to try and woo them. Oh. Oh my god. Are you listening to me? No. He admitted with a laugh of disbelief leaving his mouth. 
I had no idea. I, do I like him back? I've never had anyone express any kind of romantic interest in me Hitoshi wondered despite the fact that there was a knife to his throat at the current moment in time. I am not your friend right now, Hitoshi. Gyro hissed between tightly clenched teeth as she pressed the blade of the knife closer to his throat. And it doesn't matter what happens between you and Takoyami now. He's been dealt with. A switch flipped as Hitoshi was forced back into focusing on Gyro and his eyes narrowed. What did you do to him? Let's just say. He never saw me coming and Dark Shadow is currently down for the count as well. Hitoshi grabbed her wrist as she was talking the one holding the knife twisted it to the side and then quickly hopped to his feet, but still stayed squatted. Hitoshi then yanked on Gyro's arm pulling her down so they were nearly face to face. She had no time to react when his foot one that was wearing heavy chunky heeled boots mind you made direct contact with the side of her face. Gyro slammed to the ground from the force of the impact and Hitoshi managed to yank the knife out of her hand when she went down. He stood to his fullest height, towering above the girl, his eyes glowing a vibrant purple. Here's the thing I've come to learn about myself. You can hold a knife to me all you want. Threaten me, fine whatever, but when it comes to my friends' lives being in the crosshairs I don't take it well. Jaira wiped the blood from her newly busted lip and stood up to her fullest height. She was now smirking at Hitoshi. All right dot 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 hit me with your best shot. And with that demand she pulled out another knife from her own boot. Hitoshi's knife was a standard little 4-inch hunting knife. Gyro's new knife was aimed to kill as it was easily 12 inches. It was absolutely a combat knife. She knew exactly what she was doing by putting the 4-inch to Hitoshi's throat. With a war cry Gyro charged first, running at Hitoshi the blade outward in one hand but not extended yet. Hitoshi waited as she ran at him, waited until he saw her arms start to move. He quickly ducked and rolled to the side just as was going to stab him. She turned towards him, her mouth twisted in a snarl. You don't have to do this Gyro, Hitoshi told her. You really don't. There was no remorse in her eyes, no guilt, no pleas of but they have my family. There was just a malicious cold stare in her wake. There would be no talking her out of this, especially when she said in a cold voice, When I catch you, and I will, I'm going to cut those wings off of your back. Hitoshi narrowed his eyes. Where is Fumikage? Gyro. Gyro charged again and this time Hitoshi didn't wait. He leapt up into the air and used his wings to lift himself off of the ground and with one mighty push of his wings he grabbed onto the railing of the ceiling with one arm and hung there while looking down at Gyro. Really, Gyro? He asked her in a soft voice. Her eyes narrowed as she tightened her hand around her knife. Hitoshi still kept a grip on his own knife as he stared at her. You know this is a losing battle, right? Moss is getting the teachers, help is coming. First, Gyro was on the ground, then suddenly she was running. Running upwards, Hitoshi let out a gasp as he extended his arm out just in time for their blades to connect. You have a quirk. What? You thought you were the only one. Gyro grinned. I was already in my tank before you. She then grabbed onto him and had one arm wrapped around his neck to keep herself in the air. They must have looked like lovers hugging in the air if it wasn't for the knife suddenly sinking into Hitoshi's collar. She can't stay in the air. I can't drop her, she'll die. Hitoshi felt no pain, even when Gyro removed the knife from his collar. All he felt was cold air hit his new wound. The words why didn't you tell anybody died on his tongue in an instant. He knew why she didn't tell anyone. The element of surprise, that's why. But that didn't stop his next question. Then why are you complaining? You got a quirk. You don't get it, do you? Gyro added more weight to her blade and Hitoshi had to let go of the railing and flap his wings a few times to keep himself steady in the air. The wings were suited for me. For when I became a hero, they were picked out for me. You were supposed to get the quirk I have now. Airwalk was supposed to help you jump higher and maneuver better in the air. But Nyes the fucker convinced Daddy Dearest to swap the quirks without telling me. Gyro let out a scream and there was a noise of something sinking into flesh. Hitoshi saw blood collect along Gyro's right shoulder and dribble down. She moved forward and Hitoshi saw a knife sticking out of Gyro's shoulder. Hitoshi then looked down. Toga had entered the gym, the doors shutting loudly behind her. She had tossed the knife with such precision it was impressive. Not as impressive as the fact that she also had another knife at her disposal. When Hitoshi ran out of our dorms as quickly as he did I had a feeling something had happened. Don't worry, Hitoshi. Gabai and Tenko are getting the heroes now for you Toga pointed her knife at Gyro. How dare you. We trusted you. We mourned for your loss and you just Toga gnashed her sharp teeth together. It pisses me off. Stay out of it. Gyro yelled to her and Toga clutched her remaining knife so hard that it turned her knuckles a stark white. Stay out of it. Knowing that you're working with the thing that took my quirk Toga took a step forward. I think not. Hitoshi. Kick her to me. I'll show her how one actually uses a knife. We're not killing her Hitoshi dodged and pushed Gyro back right when she swung her knife around to stab him. She got him right in the cheek with that sharp blade. He let out a cry of alarm but his adrenaline kept him from feeling pain. His pushing Gyro away from him was more of a reflex than anything. 
Thankfully, when she fell she hit a pile of mats breaking her fall and keeping her from hitting the hard and unforgiving ground. Gyro jumped up quickly. Hitoshi let out several loud pants as he swiped at his new wound, smearing his own blood all over his face as he did so. Toga let out a battle cry as she rushed at Gyro with a fast speed Gyro leaped in the air easily jumping over Toga. Hitoshi gave his wings one big and mighty flap, sending a gust of wind straight to Gyro, knocking her off balance and back to the ground. The drop wasn't deadly but it stunned her for just a few seconds. Those few seconds were all Toga needed. Toga grabbed Gyro's ankle and pulled the girl directly under her. Gyro slashed with the knife but Toga grabbed her wrist with lightning fast speed. Didn't I tell you I love blood? My quirk made me crave blood to survive. Toga hissed as she tightened her grip around Gyro's right wrist. I learned how to use a knife from an early age and only perfected my techniques in knife wielding. Compared to me you're a novice. There were several sounds as their knives clashed, Toga being able to stop Gyro from stabbing her time and time again with ease. At one point Hitoshi was sure he saw their knives spark. Toga managed to knock the blade from Gyro's hand with raised her own blade up and Hitoshi realized what was going to happen. Toga, no, Hitoshi raced to stop Toga from killing Gyro. S-H-I-N-K. Hitoshi stopped in mid-air with a gasp as he covered his eyes, fearing the absolute worst. Slowly he peeked through his fingers to look at the damage. Gyro wasn't dead thank god no. Toga had taken Gyro's knife and sunk it right next to Gyro's head, an intentional scare. Hitoshi dropped down from the air and rushed to the girls. Hitoshi was panting heavily as was the others. You were made a fool. Toga was staring at Gyro with unforgiving eyes. Gyro gnashed her teeth together as she stared at Toga. Hitoshi saw blood and saw just where Toga stabbed Gyro. She stabbed Gyro right through her knee, keeping her pinned to the ground. You got too comfortable with your role and because of that you got caught. Gyro was clearly trying not to scream in agony as she panted and stared at Toga. Hitoshi grabbed Gyro by her shirt and lifted her up this agitated Gyro's new wound and she stifled a scream. Fumikage, where is he? Gyro panted through gritted teeth and then just pointed. She pointed towards the closet. Hitoshi dropped her and ran for the closet. Hitoshi nearly ripped the closet door off of its hinges he fell to the ground right as he opened the door dark shadow let out a roar and let the darkness of the gym fuel her anger as she grew to unimaginable heights. Her yellow eyes glowed in the dark and were fueled by anger. What kept her at bay while in the closet? Gyro had put in some sort of super powerful light in the closet. One that made it look like a mini sun was in the closet. Now in the darkness, nothing could stop Dark Shadow from avenging her injured host. Fumikage was on the ground and was thankfully still alive as he was cradling a wound on his side that was still bleeding on the ground. Hitoshi only saw this for a second before Dark Shadow surly around him and encased him in her darkness. Dark Shadow Fumikage yelled loudly but it did no good. She was pissed. If Toga wasn't going to kill Gyro, Dark Shadow was. Her yellow eyes turned red in her ire and even Toga let out a soft oh shit. When Dark Shadow let out an enraged roar that shook the windows of the gym, Hitoshi had never seen Dark Shadow this pissed before and he felt helpless as he just stared at this massive beast before him. However, salvation came when the doors to the gym opened. Steaming and desperate sunlight weakened Dark Shadow considerably. Keep the doors open. Hitoshi yelled to whoever had come in. He was relieved to see not just his father's, but it looked like the whole cavalry had come as all the UA teachers swept into the gymnasium with Izuku on Nensu's shoulders. Dabai and Tenko were there as well. Dabai was quick to run to Toga's aid and help her to her feet. Fumikage was dropped when Dark Shadow continued to shrink as Tashinori turned the lights to the gym back on. Fumikage let out a groan when he hit the ground and Hitoshi rushed to him. Are you okay? Hitoshi asked as he held Fumikage's head up. She got you too, huh? Fumikage grunted as he looked at Hitoshi's cheek and collar wounds. Yeah, but I'll live. Let's get you up. Buddy, on three Hitoshi counted to three and let Fumikage lean on him while the teachers were quick to surround Gyro and Toga. If it wasn't for her Hitoshi tried to come to Toga's aid but Nedzu put a paw up, silencing him quickly. I'm aware. The cameras need to be checked and as it stands four students got into a rather bloody knife fight in the gym. This includes you and Takoyami. Your wounds will be healed but unfortunately, until we've seen the camera footage, you all have to wear quirk suppressants and cuffs. I do hope you all understand. I don't need suppressants. Toga pointed out as Mike had to cuff her seeing how she didn't have any injuries that needed healing. Recovery girl looked over Hitoshi and Fumikage and determined them well enough to kiss. Each received a kiss for their wounds and each of them nearly dropped to their knees afterwards as their stamina nearly emptied completely. Yet, nothing is more embarrassing than having your own father cuff you and put suppressing cuffs around your wings. Why didn't you just call me? Shouta asked as he finished adding the cuffs. Fumikage was in danger, Hitoshi whispered. You wouldn't do the same. This isn't about me, Shouta grunted. They were all a spectacle being hauled out of the gym in cuffs and suppressants. Izuku jumped from Nedzu and onto Hitoshi's shoulders, where he lay across offering the most he could at this time. 
his emotional support and for that Hitoshi was grateful. Cameras were checked as promised and Takoyami was in the clear. Hitoshi got a scolding from a lifetime by all three of his dads. While they were happy he came out of this unscathed. They were mostly upset that he didn't tell them that one, Takoyami may be in danger, and two, that he has reasons to believe there may be a traitor amongst them. Hitoshi kept his head down as his parents each basically had a verbal go at him. So, while both he and Takoyami were in the clear for self-defense they were still to be punished for not sharing their information with a teacher. If you would have just gone to us we could have not only investigated Jiro immediately, but would have put her into an interview room and made sure she had no weapons on her. So, because of both of your poor judgments you both will be under house arrest for four days straight. This means you can't attend class and you can't leave the dorms for any reason outside of taking trash out. Understood. Shouta told the two of them and they didn't like it, but they understood. Toga was the only one who couldn't come away from this without taking direct punishment from Nezu. Even though she came in and even saved Hitoshi there was still the fact that she wasn't a hero, not even in the hero course. She was a gen and student who had taken part in a knife fight and stabbed Gyro through the leg. Unfortunately both boys had to bow out when Shouta demanded they get back to the dorms. The others won't be happy to learn what Gyro did. Hitoshi whispered as he and Fumikage walked back towards the dorms. Moss was sitting quietly across Hitoshi's shoulders. I just, I can't believe it myself. Fumikage admitted as well. There were no signs. Nothing and she did it just because she wanted. He looked at Hitoshi and then went quiet. These, Hitoshi finished as she unfurled his wings to show them off a bit before furling them against his back once more. I can't believe it either. But at the same time, he bit his lip. He thought of his younger self with a quirk he hated. A quirk that he believed killed his father and left him trapped with his uncle. If he learned of a villain that would take away his quirk and give him a better quirk, would he have done it, risk everything and betray everyone just so he could have the possibility of having a better quirk? A part of me does see where maybe she's coming from. Itoshi finally told Fumikage. She wanted to be a hero, most likely a spotlight hero. I'm willing to bet she would have used the savage villains who stole her quirk for her backstory and how tough it was for her to get used to having wings. Fumikage only shook his head. But Nyes messed it up when he swapped the quirks. They made it to the dorms and both boys just looked at it before looking at each other. Let's just dot 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 get this out of the way. Itoshi whispered and Fumikage grabbed his hand. Let's. The others couldn't believe it when the information was finally relayed back to them about what had happened. Momo actually broke into tears upon hearing the news. Several people wanted to try and deny it but the fact that Itoshi and Takoyami still had scars from the attack shut them up pretty quickly. They explained what happened in the gym and how Toga had come in and saved Hitoshi. Several students, those closest to Jiro, just couldn't believe it and Hitoshi spoke the truth. He couldn't believe it either. I just… Momo made herself a pack of tissues with her elbow and used the tissues to dab at her wet eyes. I just don't understand. She Momo shook her head as she gave a soft sob to the whole situation. There were no signs. She finally yelled. None at all. Even Monoma was pensive as he let his head hang and stared at the ground. It wasn't a fun night. Many tears and curse words were to be had. By the end everyone just returned to their rooms. Things changed in 1A. It was hard to say if it was for the better or the worse, but things did change and after this betrayal they'll never be the same. Itoshi sat on his bed with Fumikage sitting next to him. Neither of them really spoke as they just leaned against one another and sat in comfortable silence. Moss was asleep in his own bed tucked away against the wall. I'm glad Itoshi started softly, which made Fumikage look at him. That you're okay. I was worried. Fumikage nodded. I was worried as well when I could hear the fighting. Dark Shadow was furious, as you saw. Hitoshi nodded along with Fumikage's words as he brought his knee up to his chest and let his other leg dangle off of his bed. Hitoshi then smiled while leaning into Fumikage's shoulder. I'm sorry. Hitoshi whispered. It's okay. In the end we escaped with minimal damage. No. Hitoshi shook his head as he cut Fumikage off. I'm sorry dot 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 that I never realized dot 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 that you had a crush on me. If what Jiro was saying was true, that is. He whispered the last part and shut his eyes. He felt Fumikage tense a little. I have never felt attraction before I met you. Fumikage finally admitted. Truthfully, I didn't even know what I was feeling when I first laid eyes on you. He turned his head away and it became clear that he was blushing. You, amongst all the other applicants that day you stood out immediately to me. I still remember what you were wearing. You were wearing a striped dress with leggings and wearing the same boots you're wearing now. You were radiant. Hitoshi's face must have lit up like a Christmas tree as he clutched at his heart. Nobody has ever called me radiant before. He whispered with a tiny laugh trembling out of his lips. He, of course, wasn't laughing at Fumikage but more at the surprise of it. Well dot 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 it's true. Fumikage whispered, at least to me. Hitoshi leaned against Fumikage once more before he looked up at him and smiled. Do you want to dot 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 try? He inquired. Try dating. 
That is, I won't lie to you, Hitoshi. I'm asexual. I'm not aromantic though. I'm okay with a relationship but if you're looking for anything sexual, I'm not. Itoshi admitted and brought both of his legs on the bed. Honestly, I never thought I'd ever be in a relationship. Period. I'm, I'm okay with no sex. He told Fumikage and this made Fumikage smile. But, I do need to ask, are you okay with kissing and cuddles? Or are you against them completely? I'm okay with physical contact. Just not anything past a kiss. I think, I may have to see. It may be hard to believe but, outside of my own mother I've never been kissed before. Same well, outside of the fosters. I've gotten plenty of cheek kisses from them. Hitoshi blushed. But, there's no rush. Then at all. Fumikage agreed with a nod and Hitoshi smiled as he rested against his friend boyfriend. This was going to be interesting, but he was ready. Moss helped Hitoshi clean the bathroom. An unfortunate part of his punishment was being forced to help clean the dorms. Fine, Hitoshi was up for the challenge. He was on his hands and knees scrubbing the bathroom floor with a damp cloth. The smell of disinfectant hung in the air and made Hitoshi's nose scrunch at the smell as it stung the inside of his nasal cavity. Moss had a cloth as well and was getting the harder to reach areas for Hitoshi. At least today is the last day of house arrest. Hitoshi sighed and pulled his mask down over his chin and looked at Moss. Moss nodded as he wiggled out from behind the sink and shook himself off. It seemed he agreed. Hello. Both Hitoshi and Moss turned towards Tashinori's voice as the man walked into the bathrooms. I, I. Hitoshi vocalized when Tashinori stepped on the tile. We just cleaned these floors. Moss meowed in the same tone as Hitoshi. Tashinori only smiled and took a few steps back so he was no longer touching the tile. He had a ramune in his hand. Apologies. I just heard about what happened and saw that you were working hard. I thought I'd offer you a soda. Tashinori said as he extended the ramune to Hitoshi. Moss sat up and watched with a head tilt. Oh, thank you. Hitoshi was rather grateful for the drink as he grabbed it. Upon a quick inspection he saw it wasn't open so he accepted the gift with a smile. He popped the marble down and took a greedy swig from the drink. Thank you. Of course. It's important that you stay hydrated. How are you? Tashinori inquired and leaned against the doorframe while watching Hitoshi clean up his rags. Hitoshi bunched the rags in one hand while taking another drink of his ramune. Okay as I can be. He told Tashinori. I mean, Jairo was my friend, you know. At least, I thought she was. He then turned away and took another drink. But, I guess it can only get better, right? Yeah, that's one way to look at it. What's going to happen to Jairo? Hitoshi asked as he leaned down and grabbed the bucket filled with dirty disinfectant water. The water sloshed a little and Hitoshi was quick to correct it before it spilled over. Tashinori gave a forlorn headshake. Jail was all he had to say about it and didn't go into any more detail so Hitoshi didn't press it. Instead he drank more of his drink. Oh, that reminds me. Izuku, I got you some treats. Izuku's ears perked at the promise of a treat. Tashinori pulled out some cat treats that looked like temptations. Tashinori for a minute to cough and then he quickly wiped his hand over his mouth to remove any spittle. He then reached into the bag and tossed a couple of temptations near Izuku, knowing better than to approach him as the cat was still weary. Izuku sniffed the treats before eating them. Tashinori then waved at Itoshi. Well, I need to go and talk to an old friend. I just thought I'd check up on you too. Tashinori said to the two of them with a wave divided by. Well, thank you. Itoshi added while he finished the soda and tossed it into a nearby bin. The soda was nice. Tashinori gave him one final smile and then looked down at Izuku. Izuku flicked his ears at Tashinori and his gaze was on the verge of cautiousness while he stared at the man for several seconds. Young Izuku, I don't know if I ever said this yet but, I'm sorry. Tashinori finally said in a soft voice before he would turn and leave the bathroom before either of them could respond. Izuku's ears went back before he backed up and then jumped onto Hitoshi's shoulder. Hitoshi reached up and gently patted Masa's head. Feel better. Hitoshi inquired once Tashinori was gone and out of earshot. Izuku gave nothing away as he stared at Hitoshi for a moment. Then he turned his head away. Hitoshi missed the mind link and it appeared Izuku did as well. They were both quiet while Hitoshi cleaned up his remaining mess, washed the bucket out, and put the rags in the dirty laundry. Hitoshi walked back into his bedroom and once through the door he sat on his bed and placed Moss down beside him on the bed. Moss gave a soft mew and stepped into Hitoshi's lap, curling into a ball and laying there with his head on Hitoshi's knee. I'm going on a date with Fumikage this Friday. Hitoshi told his friend while he gently ran his fingers down Moss's head and spine. Moss leaned into Hitoshi's touch and just gave a soft purr. Hitoshi took this as acceptance before he gently scratched under Moss's chin. Moss's ears went back and he gave another loud purr at this, clearly loving the scritches he was receiving. I can't believe I'm going on a date. He whispered more to himself than to his cat. I never thought. I honestly never thought it was possible if I'm being completely fair. That nobody would ever dot 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 see me the way Fumikage has seen me. He leaned back on his hands and gave a soft smile. 
It's going to be interesting for sure. So, I want you to be on your best behavior at the movies. Oh, I'm invited. Izuku thought with a bit of a smile on his own face. Just behave in the theater, all right. Izuku nodded and Hitoshi smiled before he pressed Izuku's face to his stomach and then leaned back on his hands. He then felt his wings give a tiny flutter before they furled back against his back. The two of them stayed pretty quiet before Hitoshi shut his eyes and just fell to his side against his pillows. He was pretty tired and a nap was calling him and Moss as well as his cat just curled up against his stomach in a ball. Yeah, a nap was what they needed after all of this madness. Hitoshi quietly ran the brush through his hair, sweeping his ponytail to the side to get the knots out with his brush. He still wasn't used to his hair being flat and not up in the air. He let his hair go and it splayed out against his neck. His hair was wavy and he quietly ran his fingers through it. Hitoshi looked at himself in the mirror and debated if he wanted his hair up in a ponytail or down. What do you think? He asked Moss after a while. I always wear it up in a ponytail to keep it off of my neck. He hummed as he mimicked putting his hair up into a high ponytail. I just wish it would go back to normal. He whispered the last part more to himself than to Moss. Hitoshi decided to down for now. It really was getting long after three years without a haircut. It was now gazing just past his shoulders. Hitoshi then stepped back and looked at himself in the full-length mirror. Here he was, light makeup on his face to cover up his eye bags, in his first ever skirt, and cat hoodie crop top with his chunky heeled boots to give him extra height. He grasped his shoulders and looked back at Moss. Moss just gave him a simple nod despite him not asking the question. Moss was telling him that he looked fine. Itoshi rubbed his hands together nervously. Ready? He asked Moss and his cat just emerged from his bed, lapped at his fur for a moment, before approaching Hitoshi. Hitoshi put the service animal vest on Moss and then, for good measure, a leash. Hitoshi then went to open his door only to find Fumikage looking ready to knock. Hey! He greeted his friend and Fumikage cleared his throat. Good evening. Fumikage greeted nervously as they both looked away from one another unsure on how to proceed. Finally, Hitoshi grabbed Fumikage's hand and started for the elevator. We shouldn't waste any more time. He laughed more out of nervousness than anything else and it seemed Fumikage caught on as well as he gave his own nervous laugh. Together they got inside of the elevator. They waited for it to go down with Hitoshi grabbing onto Moss to keep him caught in his arms. The doors opened and the two boys didn't even really say goodbye to anyone as they ran out of the dorms. But dot 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 bye. Hitoshi heard Monoma say just before the dorms doors closed behind him. He'd apologize later. For now he was going on his first ever date. A date. It wouldn't be until they got on the bus would they finally calm down as they sat next to one another. They both gave soft laughter once the bus started moving and realized that this was actually happening. Still, they would relax into one another as the bus moved on. Both boys leaned against one another and were able to relax. The bus ride was short and sweet to the movie theater closest to UA. It stopped a block away, and the two boys got off. Moss was resting on Hitoshi's shoulder keeping his owner's neck warm. What movie did you want to see? Fumikage asked as they walked towards the theater. H.M. There's that latest horror movie. Hitoshi pointed out and Fumikage sucked on his teeth nervously at that. You see, Dark Shadow doesn't take horror too well. I can handle it. Dark Shadow popped out of Fumikage's side with a chirp. I swear I can, Fumikage. She insisted. Erm, um, Fumikage didn't seem so convinced. Are you worried she might go feral? Hitoshi inquired while they kept on walking. No, you know how she spooks. Fumikage explained. I can handle it. I swear, give me a chance. Dark Shadow continued to insist in a begging tone. This made Fumikage sigh in defeat. All right, don't make me regret it, Dark Shadow. Fumikage told his quirk as she moved around so she was now on his other side. This made Hitoshi smile as he took Fumikage's hand into his own and the two of them walked down the sidewalk. It really wouldn't be too much longer before they could see the theater. The movie theater was filled with people wanting to go and see the movies. It would take a few good minutes for them to get their tickets before they got inside the theater. They got their snacks, with Hitoshi buying some food for Moss as well as him. Girls actually cooed and approached as they spotted Moss sitting obediently on Hitoshi's shoulder. They did ask if they could pet him, but Hitoshi had to turn them down explaining that Moss was on duty. They were dejected but respected his bounders and moved on. So, Hitoshi and Fumikage walked into the theater and picked their seats. They were the only ones in there, for now, and managed to get some good seats. Please tell me you like horror, Hitoshi asked and that made Fumikage give a small smile. I do. It's Dark Shadow that doesn't really enjoy the subject. I can handle it this time. Dark Shadow gave Hitoshi two thumbs up before retreating back to her owner. Hitoshi chuckled. I'm sure you can. He told her as more people started to pile into the theater. Hitoshi gave some popcorn to Moss as they waited for the movie to start. It wouldn't be long before the lights would dim down and the trailers for other movies would start. Hitoshi grabbed onto Fumikage's hand and Fumikage returned this by holding Hitoshi's hand as well. Hitoshi leaned in and whispered, If I'm being too touchy for your liking let me know and I'll back off. 
he told Fumikage. The last thing he wanted was to make his date uncomfortable. Will do. Fumikage whispered back. I'm okay with hand holding. Good to know. When the movie started everything was fine. Neither boy really flinched or jumped at the start. Moss did give a small jump at an unexpected jump scare. But nothing insane. But then the movie ramped things up to 11. It became bloody fast with the killer going on a rampage. Itoshi felt himself go squeamish at some bits but was able to hold it together. Dark Shadow on the other hand. There was a sudden scare when the protagonist turned and the killer was right there. It made everyone jump. But Dark Shadow's demonic scream from such a freight made everyone jump even higher and turn an alarm. Dark Shadow. Fumikage whispered, clearly embarrassed, as he tried to wrangle his quirk in. Apologies. Apologies. He yelled to the crowd of people glaring at them. Dark Shadow clammed up but was clearly shaking as the movie went on. Do we need to leave? Itoshi whispered. No, no. Dark Shadow shrank into Fumikage and kept her eyes peeking out as she shook. Moss jumped onto Fumikage's shoulder and sat next to Dark Shadow. The quirk slowly raised a hand and just gave Moss a comforting pat as she continued to watch. Hitoshi looked back at the movie and drank some water while watching. Everything was going good for a good 30 minutes. No outbursts from Dark Shadow and Hitoshi allowed himself to relax. Then the killer came in with another jump scare and Dark Shadow gave another shriek of terror. Popcorn flew as movie agors jumped high in their seats and some of that Hitoshi was sure was deliberate as the popcorn felt like it was being pelted at them from some of the angles they were hitting them. Hitoshi couldn't help it. He laughed as he dusted popcorn off of himself. I think Dark Shadow is scaring them more than the movie. He told Fumikage. It would appear so. Fumikage grumbled darkly while looking at his quirk, who had sunk back down into him to continue watching the film. We should go. We're disturbing the others as is. Okay. Itoshi didn't fight it as he stood and so did Fumikage. Out of politeness they left the theater unsure on how the movie would end. Once out of the theater Hitoshi looked at himself and Fumikage and just laughed. They both had popcorn that wasn't their own, stuck them and looked rather ridiculous. Well, that was an interesting first date. He said as he picked a piece of popcorn out of his hair. Maybe next time we should stick to a family-friendly movie. There's a next time. Fumikage inquired as Moss jumped down from him and jumped up to Hitoshi's shoulder. Of course. Hitoshi laughed. Of course. He said this time a little more seriously. I had fun and besides, it was a lesson learned for sure. No more horror movies for Dark Shadow. Dark Shadow poked her head up and gave a very obvious pout at this as her yellow eyes narrowed. Absolutely no more horror movies. Fumikage scratched the back of his head with his own laugh. So now what? He asked. Wanna hit up the arcade? Sure. Was it the best first date? No, but it sure as hell was fun and really that's all that matters. Bonus. Izuku stared as Hitoshi slept. Hitoshi was peaceful as he slept on his side so as not to agitate his wings. He just watched his friend sleep before sighing and jumping on the bed. I love you. He mooed. Of course, he meant this platonically as he rested under H. Itoshi's arm. And I'm going to make sure that Nyes will never get his hands on you again. Even if it's the last thing I ever do. He mewed again while he shut his eyes and tried to get some sleep but sleep wouldn't come. Something was coming. Izuku could feel it. It was like a brewing storm off in the distance and he knew it would only be a matter of time before it found them once again. Between all that has happened to their foster children whenever the fosters turn their backs, especially now with what happened with Jaira, it's only natural that all three of the fosters were on red alert when it was time to take Iri out because she had a baseball game. Itoshi and Moss were able to come as the game happened outside of his four-day house arrest. What surprised them was when Hitoshi asked if his friends could come. That's how they were all bringing. Not just their own children, but Takoyami, Monoma, Bekugo, and Momo as well. It was a humid day and by the time everyone found a spot in the stands they were already sweating. Everyone was cheering on their children trying to be the loudest as the six-year-olds all got ready to go on the field. Eri was the only girl and she was beaming when she saw all of those that came to see her. She waved at them briefly before the game started. Some kids were ready to give it their all while other kids were clearly just there because their parents made them sign up. Those kids often sat in the grass picking at it rather than focusing on the game. Eri was not one of these kids as she was more than happy to be there and show off all she learned. Though, Shouta noted that sexism was rampant as he heard several people complain about her being able to be up to bat. Get the girl off the diamond. Boys only. One parent shouted and that parent was directly below them. Eri either didn't hear or didn't care as she raised her bat and waited for the pitcher. Buo, a woman, also below them, jeered. Shouta debated giving each parent a good kick in the head for Eri, but kept his cool. The pitcher threw his ball and Eri swung. She missed and that seemed to spur the adults on even more as more found it funny to boo a child. I'm going to scream. Hazashi hissed between gritted teeth as he tightened his hands into fists against his skirt. Don't, Shouta told him in a sharp tone. Avaro then leaned in. If he doesn't I will. This is insane, she's just a kid. Don't, Shouta really had to put his foot down at Avaro's threat. Hazashi was one thing but Avaro. 
Oh, man, they didn't need the game to be cancelled because Aburo fogged the field up. Then the little brat of a pitcher aimed straight for Eerie, not her bat, but right at her, and she was forced to duck to avoid the ball. The parents snickered at this and the referee did nothing. Get the girl off of the field. There were more jeers from the other parents or they started throwing food toward the fence and Shouto was about let his husbands go feral at this point. There was a sharp noise before Hitoshi's voice roared over all others. Ari, you can do it. All three of them whipped their heads to see that Hitoshi had a megaphone in his hand and Momo was quickly covering herself back up with Monoma holding a jacket to keep her covered from others. Don't listen to these assholes. I know you're doing your best. Now show them what you're made of. Hitoshi yelled the last part as loud as he could. Fuck him up. Bakugo didn't need the megaphone to be heard as he stood and just screamed. These parents are all just upset that their children aren't as talented as you and you're going to prove them right. This time Monoma stood and extended his arms wide as his face turned crazy and he started to cackle. Eri's face split into a grin as she turned and faced the pitcher with renewed vigor. She faced the pitcher and narrowed her eyes as she raised her bat steady as she narrowed her red eyes at the pitcher. For a moment nothing was said and nobody spoke as they waited with bated breath. The pitcher then raised his hand and threw the ball. The ball came rushing towards Eri at a fast right and this time she didn't hesitate. She didn't duck. She was going to make her older brother proud. She swung and the ball caught against her bat with a loud thwunk. She put some power behind that swing as the ball soared through the air right back toward the pitcher. The poor kid had no time to react. The ball caught him square in the face and sent him falling to the ground with a cry. Did Eri stop? Did she pause? No. She ran. She ran as fast as her tiny legs could carry her to first and then to second as the others ran to get the ball that had landed beside the sobbing pitching. Eri made it to third. Fourth. Can she? All of them were on their feet, cheering for her. Go, go. Shouta screamed as Eri was going for a home run. Go Eri, you can do it. Aburo yelled as loud as he clapped his hands. Don't stop. L-O-V-E-B-U-J. Run, Hizashi. Shouta turned his husband's quirk off as several people voiced complaints and had to cover their ears. The ball was being tossed around as they tried to stop Eri from getting to that final base. You can do it. Don't you dare stop. Go Eri. Hitoshi screamed into the megaphone and it was clear that Moss was joining in with his own yowling, cheering Eri on just the same. The ball was tossed to the person guarding the last base but this little boy dropped it at the very last second and scrambled to get it. Safe. They all screamed in victory as Eri made the home run and scored a point for her team. The other parents all sent them nasty looks as they did this but Shouta couldn't care less about them. The rest of the game went on with Eri's team coming out as the losers. But that was okay. Eri was still riding her high from being the only one on her team to get a home run and even her team seemed to be okay with this loss. They still cheered and congratulated the other team. Eri ran to her family and had stars in her eyes as she was beaming. Did you see me? She asked as Aburo picked her up. We did. Aburo told her. You did amazing. Eri was grinning and Shouta patted her head gently. Good job. You rocked. Monoma told her and Hitoshi nodded along with him. Dark shadow popped out of Takoyami. Congratulations. The quirk told her. Soon they were walking back to the cars in the parking lot. They passed by a snow cone vendor and Eri asked the question. Can I get a snow cone? She inquired while looking at the other snow cones that the kids were getting. Sure. Aburo didn't hesitate and then he looked at the others. Do you guys want one? He asked the other children and at first, no one stepped up. Then Momo did shyly. Can, can I get Cherry? Please and thank you she shyly bowed. Cherry, sure. And he looked at the others. Plum, he re-announced. Cola, Monoma asked. Tiger's blood, Bekugo grunted. Please, lemon, thank you. Takoyami bowed. Hitoshi thought about it for a moment as he looked over the flavors. Green tea, please. He decided and the fosters nodded. Iri got hers first and was happily munching on the sidewalk. Hitoshi walked up to her and smiled. You did good out there. He told her and she smiled at him. I was a little nervous, I won't lie. But then I heard your voice and she just continued to smile as she took a bite. I knew I could do it. Hitoshi ruffled her hair, which had to be put into a ponytail for the game, and smiled back at her. For a moment everything seemed perfect as the two siblings stood side by side. Iri raised her snow cone up. Want a bite? Well, who was Hitoshi to resist? He opened his mouth and she put a hand to his mouth stopping him. Not you, Masi. Uh, Hitoshi could hear Izuku laughing as he took a happy bite out of Iri's snow cone. There was the sound of squealing tires and everything felt like it was moving in slow motion as Hitoshi moved his head to see what was happening a van was gunning for the field and showed no sign of stopping as it was coming right for them. Hitoshi reacted on pure instinct as he pushed Eri back and threw himself away from her to create space between them so the van wouldn't hit either of them. Moss, who was standing at this point, was unfortunately lurched forward by this sudden movement and went flying towards the middle. He couldn't dodge as the van struck him and he flew over the hood and struck the windshield. The world seemed to move at normal speed the moment Hitoshi hit the ground. There were screams and cries of terror. 
Hitoshi had fallen to his side and was dazed as he saw the van come to an abrupt halt. The world spun for Hitoshi as he heard Uri's scream of terror. Or was it pain? Had he not been fast enough? Was she run over? Daddy. Daddy help me. Hitoshi sucked in several deep breaths as he was grabbed by several hands. He thought, at first, that it was someone helping him up. He saw people fleeing in terror for their own cars as they rushed by. The hands weren't gentle as they hauled Hitoshi to his feet and he realized why when the door to the van was thrown open and Hitoshi was looking in the familiar eyes of the man that he had brainwashed in the hospital. The man with the bird mask. The man who had Uri in a tight headlock. Hitoshi was then thrown into the van just the same. Daddy. Uri screamed at the top of her lungs as she struggled against the man. What was his name again? It didn't matter. The doors were shut behind Hitoshi and Hitoshi realized fearfully that he was at this guy's mercy as the van took off with squealing wheels. There was nothing in this van that could be used as a weapon. It was completely barren and Hitoshi had a feeling it was meant to be that way. This man tightened his grip on Uri as he glared at Hitoshi. I don't know about you, but she doesn't exactly look dead to me. The man told Hitoshi with no emotion and Hitoshi gulped. But you, you will be, very soon. Hitoshi gnashed his teeth as he stared at the man, the man that was now reaching for him with his hand open, the hand that didn't have a glove on. Hitoshi felt like the man was moving in slow motion as his eyes went wide. Iri came to Hitoshi's rescue. The little girl let out a war cry and then used all of her weight to stomp on the man's ankle and send him to the ground with a cry of alarm. Don't hurt my brother. She roared which brought Hitoshi back to the present. With his own war cry, Hitoshi used his wings to propel himself up and kicked the man right in the chest sending him flying back into the doors and let her go. Hitoshi grabbed onto Iri and picked her up. The van came to an abrupt stop and Hitoshi gasped when he fell to the ground. He reacted by putting a hand on Iri's head to protect her. There was a roar that bellowed from outside. It was unmistakably dark shadow and only added when she yelled. Let them go. The wheels of the tires were squealing as they struggled to fight against whatever had a hold on them. There was a growl and both Iri and Hitoshi turned to see the man getting up. Give her back to me. He then tried to charge. Hitoshi jumped back just in time making the man smash his shoulder into the wall of the van separating the drivers and the back. Hitoshi had very limited space as he slammed himself and Iri into the back doors. Hitoshi kept his grip on her tight as they both stared at the man waiting for his next move. Hitoshi immediately tried the doors, but as he figured and feared they were locked. Hitoshi gnashed his teeth while keeping Iri tight in his grip. Iri was whimpering as she clenched to Hitoshi for dear life. Don't let him take me. I don't want to go back. She whimpered to Hitoshi while shaking. Not while I'm still breathing, Hitoshi growled. The man gave a growl as he braced himself. I won't ask again. He screamed at Hitoshi and Hitoshi was sure the man was starting to break out into hives. His eyes were even watering but not from crying but from allergies. The man started to cough but held his demeanor as he stood, waiting for Hitoshi's next move. He always kept himself clean. Too clean. He'd break out into red bumps if he ever touched me without his gloves or if somebody touched him. Hitoshi remembered Iri saying. Hitoshi looked around quickly and noted that the inside of the van was spotless. There wasn't so much as a speck of dust. Iri touched him, yes, but it has to be something else than it clicked when looked at his very shirt. The shirt was coated in Moss's shedding fur. He's such a clean freak he gave himself every allergy known to man. So, Hitoshi did make the next move. It wasn't just cat fur he was fueled with after all. Hitoshi shot his wings out sending a gust of wind and feathers toward the man. The man braced himself and even grunted in pain when one of Hitoshi's white and black feathers touched the uncovered part of his face. The van lurched and it became clear that the grip dark shadow head was starting to slip. There was a scream coming from the front of the van before the van lurched again. I have to act fast. If they manage to take off then it may already be too late. Hitoshi put Uri down. Nearly dropping her, he then ripped his shirt down the middle. He prayed this would work. Hitoshi raised his ripped shirt up above his head and started to swing it around while using his wings to breeze the flying cat here, dust, and debris toward the man. However, Hitoshi realized that the man absolutely had a filter in that mask of his as while well his face broke out into irritating hives. He wasn't wheezing or coughing. You filth. The man grunted in his ire. Uri sucked in a shivering breath as she sat there with wide eyes. I'll make sure there's nothing left of your disgusting blood when I'm done with you. Yes, he had a filter, but what didn't he have? Goggles. Glasses. Something that would have blocked out the stuff from getting into his eyes and stopped his eyes from watering as badly as they were. The man stumbled but still rushed for Hitoshi. Hitoshi held his ground as he lowered his shirt from above his head and watched the leader. He remembered something Iri had told him. He would use his quirk on me if I misbehaved. And his mind went back to their first meeting. When he made Moss implode in that hospital room. So, Hitoshi knew what he had to do as he watched this man stumble towards him, his hand outstretched ready to enlist the same fate towards Hitoshi. Hitoshi, Iri screamed in fear, right when the man was going to touch him. Hitoshi ducked and rolled to the side making the man use his quirk on the van. 
The van lurched and both Hitoshi and Iri slammed into the wall of the van as the back of the van dissipated from the stranger's quirk. Kai, Iri yelled in shock when the man Kai fell from the opening that he made. And the van just continued to take off as it wasn't the engine that got destroyed. But it actually wouldn't be for far. There was a sudden explosion and the van nearly topped over, sending Hitoshi and Iri slamming into the side. The van came to a halt and stalled completely. Kai slammed into the ground and sat up as the van took off at full speed. Kai scrambled but was promptly stopped when Dark Shadow caught him in her grip. She held him up under his arms like a toddler and roared in his face. Not my friends. Hold on to me. Hitoshi ordered as he picked Iri up. She wrapped her arms around his neck. He charged forward and jumped once he reached the edge. He extended his wings out and flew into the air. He stayed in the air and watched as Dark Shadow slammed Kai into the ground before picking him up and slamming into the ground again and again and again. There was a fog in the area. Hitoshi watched as Aburo made quick work of encasing these men, the ones in Plague Doctor masks, with his clouds. Shouta was currently stomping on one man with fervent and unbridled rage. Momo and Monoma were the ones who stopped the van. It was clear that Momo had made a cannon that girl did love her cannons and Monoma had copied her quirk to make the ammo for said cannon. They were standing off to the side and looked up relieved to see Hitoshi and Uri unscathed. Momo suddenly made a bow staff and turned without a second to spare and bashed one of the Yakuza in the face with it. The man with an invisible quirk went flying. Monoma followed her lead and soon both of them were just whacking this guy with all they had. Hitoshi held Uri closely. Don't look. He ordered while keeping her head against his chest. Where the fuck are my children? Hizashi's yell made them both flinch. Hizashi had pulled the driver out and was now screaming while also stomping on him with all of his might. He would then realize that they were in the air. Hitoshi not lowering Uri until the man, Kai, was down. The kidnapping was over in less than 10 minutes. Kai was knocked unconscious laying in a crater that Dark Shadow had made by bashing him into the ground mercilessly. Fumikage had reeled Dark Shadow back in and Hitoshi was glad it wasn't dark out because otherwise he might have lost control over her. Then, just like that, as quickly as it started it was over. Hitoshi lowered himself to the ground and put Uri down once the cops arrived to arrest those responsible. Kai was awake, but it was obvious that he had more than a few broken bones and couldn't even stand. But he could talk. I'll get her back. He rasped. If it's the last thing I ever do, I wouldn't count on that. Shouta hissed as he and the other fosters surrounded Iri and Hitoshi. These are our children. Yeah. Iri puffed her chest out through teary eyes. I have three daddies who will protect me and the best big brother in the world. How many do you have? That's right. None. Because your daddy is in a coma. Hitoshi put his hand to his mouth to stifle his laughter and was clear the others did as well. Kai's face twisted in anger and try as he might there was nothing he could do as he was injected with quirk suppressants. This isn't over. He warned before the ambulance doors shut and he was driven off. Everyone gave a sigh and Hitoshi looked around once he realized something. Where's Makugo? He asked while looking past the people, the trashed field, and all the cops. Everyone picked up on this as well and looked around the same trying to find where the blonde had vanished to. It was Shouta who found him when he said a soft oh no. Hitoshi then saw Bakugo. Bakugo was on his knees in the parking lot and he had something in his arms. Something green. Shit. Hitoshi went to go but Shouta stopped him. Let me handle this. Shouta told Hitoshi and walked over toward Bakugo. Shouta put his hands on Bakugo's shoulders. He's dead. Bakugo whispered as he looked up at Shouta with misty eyes something Shouta never thought he'd ever see. Shouta squatted down so they were eye to eye. I tried I saw I saw him hit the ground. I know Hitoshi mentioned him having a healing quirk but dot 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 it wasn't fast enough. I tried to get him to hold on I tried, damn it. Bakugo brought his fist to his eye to wipe his tears, but he died in my arms and Shouta's expression softened when Bakugo let out a soft cry. I didn't want to lose him again. Shouta didn't do this often but he knew Bakugo needed it. He was gentle when he pulled Bakugo in for a hug and Bakugo reached up with his free hand and gripped the back of Shouta's shirt. It's okay, Shouta whispered to Bakugo. He heard the sound of approaching footsteps and noted that it was clearly Hitoshi coming to do damage control. Hitoshi had his ruined shirt in his hands and he squatted down and brought both of his hands out. Hand him to me. He's dead. Bakugo grunted between quivering lips. I tried. I know. Bakugo. Moss. He's immortal. Hitoshi dropped his voice to a whisper. He just can't of others knowing. Only a select few know this. In a few hours, he'll be right as right. Hitoshi was careful in his wording and gentle in his delivery. He. Pink Cheeks was right. Bakugo wiped his tears away. Yes, but she doesn't know it. As I said, only a select few know this. Hitoshi said while keeping his arms out. Bakugo looked down at Masa's body before looking up at Hitoshi. Oh how many times has he? Bakugo inquired while handing the cat over. Hitoshi was gentle when he wrapped Moss in his ruined shirt to keep his body hidden. It was clear that his neck snapped when the van hit him. I lost count. We all have, Shouta admitted next. He'll be back. So, don't fret, kid, you did your best. 
Shouta was gentle as he rasped his knuckles against Bakugo's shoulder. And you've grown, was the last thing he said before standing. Yeah well, that cat is gonna get it. Mac and me fucking cry. He hissed only half seriously while wiping his eyes one last time. The day was exciting and terrifying all in one and it was over. They would go back to UA unharmed for the most part. That is and continue on as if nothing happened. Moss would wake up later that night and he seemed fine. Though, Hitoshi still missed their mind link. But it wasn't the approaching storm. The storm coming was going to be massive. Nice was back and wouldn't be stopped until he got the one thing he wanted more than anything. The feeling of warmth. Bonus. I'm just going to come out and say it. I know who you are. Shoto said plainly as he walked up to Dabai. For a moment the two of them looked at each other. And just who do you think I am? Dabai inquired as he kept his face mask secure over the lower half of his face. You're Taoya. You're my dead brother. Or rather me brother who should be dead. Shoto mumbled and this made Dabai look at him in surprise. The man just blinked slowly before giving a sigh and lowering his face mask. How do you figure it out? I didn't. I was lying. Shoto admitted with a bit of a smug look on his face and this made Dabai or rather Tower roll his eyes with a grunt. Well, you got what you wanted. You figured me out. What are you gonna do next? Go to Natsuo. Or Fayumi. About this discovery. No Shoto admitted as he looked away from Taoya. I just wanted to invite you. Invite me where? Taoya raised his eyebrow in question. To visit mom with me on Sari. I'm sure she'll be happy to see you again. Another one. Shino Monoma sighed as she walked out of her office. It had been a long day and she was ready to lay down and rest. See you guys tomorrow. She told her co-workers as she walked briskly out of the building and towards her car. Shino hummed to herself, her white hair gently tickling the back of her neck as she reached into her purse and pulled out her keys. With a click of a button, her car sprang to life and unlocked the doors. Shino got into the car and put her purse into the passenger side. She yawned loudly and was just ready to call it a night. Shino looked into her rearview mirror and... Don't move. A cold hand clamped down hard on her mouth from her backseat. The fingers dug into her soft flesh as they kept an iron grip on her mouth. Don't. Move. The person demanded again. I have to say, you're not what I expected out of a sister Nye's laugh softly while he leaned himself from around the seat. He looked at Uncanny. Something that was trying to pass as human but clearly wasn't. You weren't easy to track. Shino shut her eyes as she shivered fearfully. Unable to move or speak as Nye's had an iron grip on her. He had too many quirks for her to copy to get out of this situation and not only that the quirks she could feel felt too powerful for her to copy. In a surprising move, Nyes let go of her mouth. I want you to answer a question for me. Shino swallowed hard and looked at him. What and just like that her mind went blank, she felt like she was in a fog. Where is my mother? After what happened between Overhaul and the Yakuza there was a raid in the Yakuza headquarters and several people were arrested by Night Eyes Agency. Class 1 was watching as this all happened live on the news. Hitoshi knew his dad was part of the raid along with Mirio, Tamaki, Kirishima, Nito, Momo, Su, and Achako as they were all doing their work studies. Hitoshi was going to do his own work studies in a week as Hawks wanted both him and Fumikage. Tons of the Yakuza were being arrested and holed out of the building in cuffs. Hitoshi looked at Mirio as he was the next one to hop onto the screen with a doctor in cuffs, leading this doctor in a plague mask towards a cop car. Nito was in the background and helping the heroes by showing them which way to go. Wow, Mina whispered as they watched this all go down. Who knew the Yakuza was this big? There was a chorus of others shaking their heads and agreeing with her. Moss was laying down clearly asleep in Bakugo's lap. Hitoshi couldn't help himself. He leaned down and gently stroked Moss's head and down his back. Moss woke with a loud MRPP, before gently licking Hitoshi's fingers that were by his mouth his tongue scratchy against Hitoshi's skin. Then Hitoshi's trust was betrayed when Moss bit him. Hey hey. Hitoshi yelled when Moss was quick to entrap his wrist, digging his claws into Hitoshi's hand, and Rabbit kicking him while biting him. M. Moss. Hitoshi gasped as he struggled against his cat. Moss paused, his ears twitching as he narrowed his eyes at Hitoshi. Then he finally let Hitoshi go and shook his pelt off. Moss then jumped on Bakugo's shoulder. Fat ass. Bakugo grunted as he had to make sure he was steady while he swayed a bit. Moss, clearly not happy at being woken from his catnap proceeded to kick Bakugo in the face. Not once, not twice, but three times in rapid fire. There was a silence as everyone watched in horror. Even Hitoshi couldn't believe Moss did that. Bakugo looked at Moss out of the corner of his wide eyes. I'm going to kill you. Bakugo roared and Moss was quick to jump off of Bakugo's shoulder. Thus the chase began. Bakugo was no match for Izuku as the cat was much more stealthy and able to turn sharper corners than he could. Bakugo didn't use his quirk in his dorms. He wasn't allowed to so he had to give chase on foot. Denki was grinning as he brought his phone up and started to film the chance. This is totally going on YouTube. He whispered just loud enough for Hitoshi to hear. Mina was grinning devilishly as she brought her own phone out and started to film the same as Denki. Bakugo and Moss ran through the common room with Moss jumping on the furniture to evade Bakugo. 
Moss jumped on one of the bar stools and the stool spins with this movement making him spin a circle for a moment. He then jumped back down just in the nick of time as Bakugo nearly barreled over the stool. Moss rushed on the coffee table then to the couch, and then he jumped as high as he could where he managed to get to the ceiling fan that was thankfully off. Then there was just silence as Moss slowly turned with the fan and stared down at the others as he did this. Bah! Bakugo waved the cat off from his spot on the floor now giving up his retribution. He put his hands on his hips and just shook his head. Your ass is so fat the blade is bending, Bakugo told him. Moss gave a hiss at this and Hitoshi knew exactly what his friend was saying at this moment. I'm not fat. Well, Denki decided to pile on. Hey man, he isn't fat. He said and Bakugo raised an eyebrow while Moss just nodded. He's an absolute unit. There's a difference. This got others laughing at poor Izuku. Even Hitoshi shamefully gave a laugh. Well, Moss clearly didn't like this as his ears went back and then he turned his back to them. He made himself into a loaf and just pouted on the ceiling fan. Oh, Mossy, don't be like that. Hagakir cried and Moss's ears just stayed back as he refused to look at any of them. You upset him. She pointed, Hitoshi thinks, at Denki. Apologize. Hey man, Bakugo started it. Denki protested and it made Fumikage snort and shake his head. Moss, Fumikage called to the cat. You are not fat, you are fluffy. I'm sure once shaved you will be a very lean cat. He tried to get Moss to stop pouting. Well, Moss clearly wasn't having it as he just wiggled and then rested his head flat on the ceiling fan blade. Well dot 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 let's just leave him be, Hitoshi finally said. He'll come down when he's good and ready. So, they resumed watching the TV and left Izuku alone. Izuku twitched his ears as he raised his head up and watched them from down below. Something is wrong, he thought. Something was wrong with him. He didn't feel ill but he didn't feel dot 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 well dot 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 there wasn't anything wrong with him. He was just moody. He wanted to be left alone. His wish was granted when the others did leave him beyond the ceiling fan. Izuku wiggled and got himself comfortable on that fan blade and then exhaled slowly. Nice is planning something. I can feel it deep into my bones, but what? Izuku didn't know and he knew that was causing a bunch of undue stress. He hated sitting around and waiting for Nice's next move. With a sigh, he shut his eyes and rested his head on the fan blade again. It wouldn't be long until he took a nap on the fan blade, allowing himself some respite on the fan blade and he just prayed nobody would turn it on while he slept. Izuku watched as a butterfly floated by him before landing on his nose. The butterfly was green and when it landed it fluttered its wings on his nose a few times. It made Izuku smile even when the butterfly flew away. He reached up with a paw as he watched the butterfly flee. Then, there was a loud creaking noise making Izuku turn from the rooftop. The door was open and Yoichi was staring at him. Izuku and Yoichi looked at one another and there was a pause between them. Is it really you? Or are you nice? Izuku inquired. It's me. How can I be sure? Yoichi looked confused by Izuku's question before he just slapped his arms to the side. I don't exactly have an ID. In the afterlife, Yoichi joked and that made Izuku smile a tad before he padded up to his uncle and rubbed against his legs. What happened? Izuku asked as Yoichi bent down to pick him up. Yoichi was gentle as he ran his hand from the top of Izuku's head and down his spine. Izuku gave a purr at this attention given to him. I haven't seen you in so long. Yoichi shook his head as he started to walk down the steps toward where they last spoke. The throne room. The first time, I believe, was because of Nyze's connection with All for One. Thus having a connection with us because you and Nyze have a connection allowed us to join if only momentarily as it's hard for us to connect with outsiders we weren't able to replicate it again until recently. Oh god, I swear to god. Did Tashinori give me or Hitoshi one for all? Izuku whispered as his eyes went wide. No, he went with someone else. Someone who also has a connection with All for One as well as you, just not as intense as Hitoshi's connection. Izuku blinked at Yoichi's words as they made it toward the end of the steps. Someone else. Who? His question would be answered seconds later when Nito seemed to step out of the shadows and into the center of the throne room. Surprised, Nito inquired as he made a grand gesture of sorts. Nito. Izuku gasped his mouth opened and his jaw on the floor. Izuku. Nito dipped his head and Izuku's jaw dropped even more if possible. Oh, don't give me that. Nito shut Izuku's mouth for him. You and Hitoshi weren't exactly subtle. But dot 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 how? Izuku whispered while he jumped on Yoichi's shoulder. How do you figure it out? Well, like I said, you and Hitoshi weren't subtle, but I've heard him call you Izuku on more than one occasion. Not only that but my mom has been looking into Nice and had a picture of you Izuku up. It's the eyes. Nito explained to him as he reached up and then gently stroked Izuku's head and scratched him behind the ear. Izuku looked at Nito in disbelief. Why is your mother looking into Nice? Because she's aware of him. She knows he's planning something and she's been talking to some. Interesting characters in order to gain as much information as she can. This includes All Might and a certain vigilante that Hitoshi had a run-in with during his internship. After internships and the dorms were added my mother involved herself because she figured that Hitoshi wasn't the only one in danger. 
He continued to explain while he scratched under Izuku's chin and made Izuku purr. Izuku listened to his words and it actually made a bit of sense considering all that happened. And one for all. Does your mother know that you've taken All Might's quirk? Yes, in fact, she encouraged it. If it means getting rid of all for one, my grandfather once and for all. She's not happy that I've been placed in the middle of a war but at the end of the day. If it gets rid of your father and Nyes then it's for the best. I've been training with All Might every day since receiving his quirk. Nito sighed. But you need to be a certain strength in order to use it. Nito nodded. We've come to an understanding. All Might and I I received the quirk, but can't use it until I'm at a reasonable strength. Why were you even given it? That's dangerous. Because Yoichi held Izuku under his rump and kept his close. We needed to talk to you about Nyes and all for one. After this talk, Nito will return one for all back to All Might and one receive it again until he's of needed strength. Now, last we spoke, you mentioned Nyes having a connection to your mind. Yeah, because he's you. Yes and no, Izuku explained. He's my body, but he's not me. He just thinks he's me. Regardless, he's grown stronger. Because he took Hitoshi's quirk he now has access to purgatory. Izuku started to explain. The roof up there, in case you were wondering. Yoichi nodded. Has he attacked you? Yes, he's figured out more than just to attack me. When I'm here, I'm vulnerable. This is where I go when I heal if he kills me here. I don't think I'll come back to my physical body. Izuku whispered while shaking his head slowly. Nito shut his eyes and thought for a moment. I see. Nito whispered. Is there anything else? Is there anyone he may be planning on attacking? Izuku shook his head. I don't know. Izuku, did you ever think that maybe you could see into Nyza's eyes? I mean if he could see through yours, then you could probably do the vice versa. Yoichi inquired as he moved Izuku up so they were eye to eye. I never really thought to do that. He admitted to Yoichi in a soft voice. I usually try and keep my distance from Nyza and don't even know where he resides. Nito gave a hum at this. He then sighed and patted Izuku's head. While I can't tell you what to do, I do want to say this. If we know what Nyza is planning we can stop him. How? I lost my only communication with humans. I mean I can write. But it's hard when you don't have thumbs. And he raised his paws up to show Nito the obvious fact that he, a cat, didn't have thumbs. The last time I wrote to communicate I got lucky because Aizawa was there and all I had to do was write Nyza's name. There was some silence between them as they thought about their next move. How about we get the support department to make you a translator? You are in the hero course, after all, they technically can't refuse. Nito grinned as said this and it made Izuku's ears twitch. That's a good idea, but I can't bring it up to Hitoshi to do so. Nito did give a little frown at this realizing the predicament he's in. I'll bring it up in passing. Make it seem like it was his idea then. Izuku nodded liking the idea. He then turned to look at his uncle. Yoichi gave a nod as well. For now, we just want you both to be on the lookout. Izuku keep your eyes on your dreams from here on out. No doubt Nyes is growing more active these couple of days and we need to know what he's doing. I've never met a Namu as powerful and as scary as he is. Izuku nodded. Heard. Good. Nito, you know what to do next. Be careful because the embers of one for all will still be inside of you for a while. Understood. Nito nodded the same as Izuku. Both of you and Izuku Izuku perked his ears up at Yoichi's warning tone as his uncle put him down on the ground. No matter what Nyes offers you, do not agree. If he gets his hands on your quirk he'll be unstoppable and we can't have that. He's already powerful enough for concern. Yoichi warned him and Izuku nodded in understanding. I will never let him have this quirk of mine. Good. Now, both of you go and forget this ever happened for now. Izuku woke with his ears twitching. He looked at the dusty ceiling fan before looking down below. He hadn't been out for long as the others were still in the common room and watching the TV. Izuku yawned and then stretched himself out before he jumped down from the ceiling and onto the couch. This made those sitting on the couch denky. Hitoshi and Mina all jump in surprise at the little cannonball that fell between them. Hey, you done pouting? Hitoshi asked nonchalantly as he picked Izuku up and held his friend close. Izuku stretched himself out before yawning then there was a finger in his mouth making him bite down on it in shock before he spat said finger out. Denki was grinning at Izuku as he retracted his finger back. Izuku reeled his leg back and kicked Denki right in the face. Moss. Hitoshi scolded him lightly as pulled Izuku away from Denki. You can't just kick people when they do something you don't like. Watch me. Izuku mewed and Hitoshi chuckled a little while he kept Izuku in his arms. Is somebody being grumpy? Hitoshi asked and Izuku put his paw on his friend's lips. Hitoshi only smiled at this and then put Izuku in his lap. Good news. The raid is over with no casualties. There was a fight, but everyone in the Yakuza has been arrested so everyone is on their way back. That was good to hear at least. It's great that the Yakuza were getting what they deserved after what transpired between their leader and Hitoshi. 
Things were starting to look up now if only they could get rid of knives then they can live forever happily ever after and ride off into the sunset. At least that was a plan for now. Fumikage walked behind Hitoshi and gently touched his shoulder before patting Moss. Izuku watched as Hitoshi followed his boyfriend's retreating figure with happiness in his eyes. Izuku was happy. He doesn't need you anymore. You know that right. He no longer needs you to protect him. He learned how to work his wings by himself. He fought against the leader of a Yakuza while you were dying. He's stronger now than ever before and it shows. Izuku sighed and looked down at his paws before laying in Hitoshi's lap. Hitoshi gently ran his hand down Izuku's spine and scratched the sides of his face the way Izuku enjoys. Izuku looked up at Hitoshi and it was that moment that he was reminded of something painful. Nothing ever lasts forever. Not even him. One day Izuku will eventually run out of lives for this body. He knew he became dangerously close during the USJ. When that day comes and he loses this body. He may not even be reborn in Japan. He may be reborn in America or Othian. He may not even be a cat or a human. He could be a worm. Still, while he lay in Hitoshi's lap, Izuku will just be happy he was here for now. Whatever his next life maybe should be for a while yet. The next day, Mito did as he said. You know, if he's such a smart cat you should consider getting him a translator. So you wouldn't have to guess what he wants, you know. Mito told Hitoshi as the two of them got ready to go for a jog together. A translator. Hitoshi asked while he stretched himself out. Do they make those? I mean I know anything is possible in the day and age of quirks, but, hard to say. Nito stretched one leg behind him before doing the same to the next leg. I bet you could ask the support course he then took off in a jog. Moss is a hero course student after all. He called behind him and Hitoshi took off after him looking rather thoughtful. Well, the plan worked because, after class and training, Hitoshi picked Moss up from outside of Nenzu's office and marched him right to the lab. Hitoshi hardly touched the door when an explosion rang out and he was knocked off of his feet with a body pressed against him and boobs right in his face. Hey, Hatsum, he greeted her as she looked down at him. She was covered in soot. Oh, oh hey, long time no see. She then graciously got off him and got her boobs out of his face. She lifted her goggles up and over in her head as she grinned at him. How can I help you no wait, I can guess. She looked him over and then snapped her fingers and pointed finger guns at him. You need an undersuit for wind burn. No oh. He thought about it before shaking his head. I'm not here on my account actually. She tossed her tongue at this and shook her head. Ah, sorry, buddy, rules are rules. If you're not the hero, I can't make any modifications to the person's outfit unless you're a teacher, of course. Well, you see, it's not for me. It's for O. Moss jumped up on Hitoshi's shoulder and stared at Hatsum. Moss. Hatsum blinked. You need support gear for you dot 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 cat. She asked slowly like she didn't understand the assignment. Then she grinned like all of her dreams just came true at that exact moment. Well, you came to the right person. What do you need? Battle armor. No. Oh, I got it. You want goggles. Goggles that are like my quirk and help enhance his vision. No. Hatsum rubbed downwards on her neck as she thought about it for a moment then she snapped her fingers. You need him to have a heat seeking. No. Erg. Hatsum threw her arms up and Hitoshi giggled. We would like a translator. If possible. A. Translator. I see you want to know what he says but... Is he really that smart? Don't get me wrong. I've heard all about your wickedly smart cat. But is it worth the time, effort, and supplies to make a translator? I don't know, Moss. What do you think? Hitoshi asked as he held Moss out in front of him so Moss was now in front of Hatsum. Moss only nodded very clearly what he wanted. Oh, well, Hatsum grinned as she picked Moss up from under his arms and held him at arm's length. You dot 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 are a beauty, my friend. All right, I'll make an exception. The cat will have his own support gear. Give me a week. It's possible. Hitoshi took Moss back. To actually make a translator, Hatsum winked at him before poking his nose. Anything is possible as long as I put my mind to it. She told him confidently. Hatsum, what did you do? Came her teacher's yell. The man no doubt saw the new hole and where the door used to be. A week. She yelled to Hitoshi before rushing away. Hitoshi smiled as he looked at Izuku. Well, I'm surprised we didn't think of this sooner. He told Izuku as he let his cat back on his shoulder. Izuku only nodded in agreement as he sat. Off they went glad they could eventually have conversations again. Hitoshi stretched his arms above his head as he walked by Todoroki. The two of them walking away from each other. But then Todoroki stopped and turned to look at Hitoshi like he just remembered something. Hey, yes. Hitoshi stopped walking and looked over at Todoroki. Did you ever meet your mother? Yes, Todoroki added air quotes and Hitoshi rolled his eyes so hard they nearly went into the back of his skull. No, because she wasn't there. There was nobody by that name there. Hitoshi told Todoroki and Todoroki's eyebrow arched. What do you mean? She was there during my last visit. Did you go to the right facility? Yes. Hitoshi gave Todoroki a look. Akasa Mental Facility. Todoroki shook his head firmly. No, Hitoshi. It's the Asaka Mental Facility. Hitoshi's mouth dropped open as he stared at Todoroki. 
You said Akasa. I did not. I know the facility my own mother goes to. Todoroki matter-of-factly told Hitoshi without raising his voice. Hitoshi let out a groan as he raised his head and looked at the ceiling. He didn't know how to feel as he let the wheels turn for a few minutes in his mind. Are you still planning on seeing your mother on Saturday? Hitoshi finally asked as he looked back at Todoroki. Todoroki nodded. Yeah, I'm bringing Taoya with me. He's nervous and truthfully dot 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 so am I this is the first time he'll be seeing our mother for the first time since he was. It doesn't matter. But yeah, I am. Hitoshi put his hands in his pockets. Got room for two more. Moss and I. Hitoshi raised two fingers up as he inquired. There was no way he wasn't going to have Moss with him for this. Hitoshi was going to need his bestie for this. Todoroki put his hands in his own pockets before as he thought about it. Taya is going to be the one driving. I know Toga will be with us as well. Why? Itoshi inquired while narrowing his eyes. Is she related to you? No. Does she have family there? Not that I'm aware of. Is there any reason she wants to come to a mental facility with us? Talia invited her. Itoshi snorted at that. I see. I guess I'm not the only one who needs emotional support bestie. He then rubbed the back of his head with a soft sigh. So, can I come? Todoroki shut his eyes and thought about it again. There should be room. It might be a little cramped, but there should be enough room for the two of you. Great. Let me just ask my dads and ask if it's okay. Hitoshi mumbled and after that, the two of them went their separate ways while Hitoshi called Aburo. He knew Shouta would be on patrol, and Hizashi was undoubtedly about to start his radio show. Hitoshi walked back to his room and Moss, who had been taking a cat nap moments prior perked and gave a happy mew when Hitoshi entered his dorm room. Hitoshi had his phone to his cheek and heard it ring once, twice, three times. Yes, the light of my life. I thought your husbands were the light of your life. Of course, but they aren't here, Aburo said and Hitoshi could feel his smile. Hitoshi smiled back and sat down at his bed where Moss would join him by jumping up beside him. So, I'm just going to come out and say it. I think I may have messed up. Hitoshi said though it sounded like a question. Remember how I thought I found my mom? Of course, she was supposedly in the mental facility. Aburo's interest was piqued without question as Hitoshi heard him still. But we got there and nobody by her name went there. Yeah, it turns out I may have said the wrong name. It's the Osaka mental facility, not the Okasa one. I see. Look, Itoshi sighed and then fell back on his bed. Moss took the opportunity to sit and lay across Hitoshi's stomach. God, this cat was fat. Todoroki's mother goes to the same place. I, this Sari, can I just go with him and his brother to see her? This way you guys don't have to take time out of your schedule to take me. I'll be with Todoroki and an adult. And Toga don't ask I just. I want to meet her, my mother of course. He softly told Aburo. There was a pause on the other side of the phone and Hitoshi could feel Aburo's frown. I, I won't lie, Hitoshi. I don't like the idea of you being without an adult. I know you have your license, and I know you're strong, but, the thing is you. You have knives after you. I know, I know. I'd just feel a little safer if you had one of us with you. Let me talk to the others, okay? It's not a no, it's just not a yes yet. Yeah, I understand. Hitoshi felt himself frown a bit but still looked up at his ceiling while Moss rubbed his head against Hitoshi's stomach. You'll have your answer before say, I can at least promise you that. Aburo promised and it made Hitoshi smile before nodding. Yeah, I understand. I'm not mad and if you can't do it, I understand. Yeah, talk to you later. Bye. Hitoshi then hung up and with a heavy sigh escaping his lips. He put his phone beside his head and just stared at the ceiling. He then reached over and gently touched Moss's fur. Moss's fur was smooth and fluffy as he just had a bath the other day. He leaned his head against Hitoshi's palm and purred deeply. Oh my gosh. Hitoshi gasped quickly as he sat up and nearly sent Moss flying. Moss's ears went back in irritation when Hitoshi quickly grabbed him before he fell. I almost forgot. May should be ready with your translator. He paused and looked at his phone. I have 30 minutes before the school closes. Hitoshi smiled as he picked Moss up and held his cat by his underarms. Moss gave a mew and Hitoshi hopped off of his bed. His little dilemma forgotten for the moment as he put on some slip-on shoes and then put Moss on his shoulder. Izuku sat obediently on Hitoshi's shoulder as his friend quickly grabbed what he needed before heading out of his dorm. I can't believe I almost forgot, Hitoshi muttered while stepping quickly down the hallway. Well, luck would have it. Moments later they passed by Fumikage. Hitoshi. Fumikage inquired with a head tilt when Hitoshi passed him. Hitoshi stopped and turned towards him. Is everything okay? As Fumikage said this, dark shadow popped out of his shoulder and stared at the two of them. Oh, yeah. You see, Moss here is getting support gear and we have 30 minutes before the school closes for the day. So, I was gonna rush in there real quick and grab it. Fumikage's confusion seemed to grow at this as he and Dark Shadow looked at one another before he looked back at Hitoshi. Moss is, a cat. Hitoshi smiled at this. Yes, but I thought about it and talked to Mei about it. We're getting him a translator. This way he can talk to people. Hitoshi reached up and gave Izuku a little scratch on the cheek. 
Oh, I see. I didn't think such a thing was possible, Fumikage muttered. Mind if I join? This sounds interesting. Come on, we have to hurry though. Then there were four as Fumikage and Hitoshi started to leave the dorms together. Dark Shadow decided to relieve Hitoshi as she reached and grabbed Moss off of Hitoshi's shoulder. The 15-pound boulder on his shoulder was gone, but that was fine. Dark Shadow was holding Izuku like a baby now and honestly, Izuku didn't mind this at all. Dark Shadow didn't really feel like anything. Maybe a little cold because she was made of shadow. So, she wasn't uncomfortable and she learned and was much gentler than the other times she's attempted to hold him. Dark Shadow didn't even move as she glided while attached to Takoyami, so there was no jerking back and forth from Izuku. Yeah, he was okay with this. Izuku let his head tip back when Dark Shadow started to scratch his chin. You know. Fumikage coughed and that made Izuku's ear twitch as he listened in on their conversation. Hawk's work study is this Monday. Excited. Of course I am. Hitoshi happily chirped. I get to exercise my wings a bit more and I get to train with Hawks. Note to self. Don't let Hawks talk me into going onto a tall roof. Itoshi mumbled the last part to himself. HM, I should warn you Fumikage started. That won't be easy. Hawks is fast and will leave you behind if you aren't fast enough. Itoshi nodded. I expect it as much in all honestly and I feel I'm ready. I hope I am. I have to get used to these things on my back I mean I think I'm pretty good but I'm not the best. And exposure learning will probably be my best bet. Fumikage nodded and patted Hitoshi's shoulder. You can do it. Hitoshi smiled at him. Though, I am curious. Let's say Nyes never kidnapped you and you still had your original quirk. Then Hawks probably wouldn't have had much interest in you. Who would you have gone for in that case? If you don't mind me asking. If I still had my brainwashing. Hitoshi flipped his ponytail over his shoulder as he thought about it. Well, not back to All Might that's for sure. Probably. Erm, um, Fakum. He then nodded. I would have gone with Fakum because that's who Nito and Momo went with for both internships and work studies. If he would have had me that is. Why wouldn't he? Will we're talking about my brainwashing here. Most are apprehensive about those types of quirks. Itoshi mumbled as he gave his wings a small flutter to stretch them out for a moment. While I do miss my brainwashing. A lot. At the same time I do feel. He looked back at his snowy owl wings and gave a soft sigh. I dunno, he admitted while his wings drooped slightly. Fumikage patted Hitoshi's shoulder. I get it. That was all he had to say in a reassuring voice and Hitoshi smiled at his boyfriend. Izuku lowered his ears back down and stopped eavesdropping as they were approaching Yue. Fumikage opened the door for Hitoshi and the two of them stepped into the air conditioning, away from the humidity. They breezed up to the support lab within minutes. Hitoshi was much more cautious this time around. As he approached the door he made sure Fumikage was away from it while he fluttered himself off of the ground a bit in case he needed to fly away from any explosions. Thankfully, there were none this time around. He opened the door and was grabbed by Mei instantly and hauled inside. Good, you're here and right on time. Mei yelled as she put Hitoshi on the ground with ease. Fumikage and Dark Shadow came in moments later. She looked for a moment before spotting Izuku in Dark Shadow's arms. Mei wasted no time snatching Izuku from the quirk and holding him by his underarms and in the air. You're going to love this baby I made. She told Izuku proudly. Izuku noted that it looked like she hadn't slept for some time now. Her dreads were all over the place and she was coated in dirt and soot. Her odor was less than ideal as well. May put Izuku down on a table where the others crowded around. Ta-da. She announced and presented Izuku with the translator. It dot 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 was just a thick black collar. Well, no, it wasn't. She hit buttons on the sides and the collar opened with a mechanical snap. Izuku stared at it as the side lit up bright orange then she snapped it around his neck with ease. Then with no warning, it sprang to life around him and started to cage around his mouth. It wasn't a collar it was a muzzle. The thing wrapped around his head to stay in place. Panic surged through Izuku in an instant. Izuku didn't like collars much less muzzles. And instantly he dropped to the ground and tried to get it off of his neck. He fell to his back and tried to put his hind leg under it to push it off. Get it off. He demanded with a yowl while he thrashed along the table. Moss, Hitoshi, get it off. Izuku demanded while he fought with this thing around his neck. Oh, my goddess. May breathed as her eyes lit up. Hitoshi, Izuku demanded again. Get it off me. Momo Moss. Hitoshi yelled as he grabbed Izuku quickly around the middle to get him to calm down. It's okay Hitoshi quickly pressed Izuku against his chest. It's not. It's a muzzle. A muzzle. Moss, it's not a muzzle. Have you gone blind? It, it, Izuku blinked when finally the noise hit his ears. It was electronic and kinda tinny sounding but he could hear it. He looked at Itoshi. Then at Mei who had both of her hands clasped together with the tips of her fingers against her mouth. And then at Fumikage and Dark Shadow who stared at him with wide eyes. Izuku looked at the muzzle and realized it wasn't a muzzle well. It kind of was. But it actually grates wrapped around his muzzle and covering his entire mouth. But it obviously wasn't made to silence him. Itoshi. He mewed and an electronic voice echoed this back. He could kinda see it if he focused. 
The tiny mechanisms worked inside of the grates to translate what he was saying. It works. Mei cheered loudly as she threw her arms up in the air. I knew this baby would work but it actually works. How exactly? Hitoshi inquired while he picked Izuku up to inspect the grates around Izuku's muzzle then his eyes narrowed. Wait a minute. Ah, you picked up on it. You see, what I did was I used almost the same technology used to make your own voice modifier. You see, I had an inkling that maybe he was talking but it's like another language, you know. So, with your voice modifier as inspiration, I use sound waves to translate what he's saying, not what he's thinking. May explained excitedly to Hitoshi and Fumikage. You know, he has spoken before, a few times when angry so there is some weight to that. Hitoshi mumbled as he shut his eyes and thought about it. That's incredible. Izuku mewed and looked down at his translator in surprise as he then looked at Mei, who was now blushing with pride. Yeah but, like what if he needs to eat? The muzzle kinda stops that. Hitoshi whispered and Mei struck him on the shoulder. Not a muzzle. She told him firmly before she tilted Izuku's neck towards Hitoshi and showed him the bright orange screen on the collar. You just press this button here and she pressed it. In a snap, the translator retracted from around Izuku's mouth and head and then vanished within the side of the collar discreetly. The bright orange then faded and the collar looked normal. Viola, it's now a normal collar. I made it so even Moss can turn it on if he wants. Moss, the button is. Izuku knew where the button was and without waiting for her to finish he reached up and gently pressed the button. The translator sprung back to life and snapped around his head and mouth. This time he didn't freak out but the noise was a little less to be desired. Cool, he chirped. Thank you, Mei. Mei was going to be riding this high for weeks there wouldn't be a doubt about it. There you go. A translator for your wickedly smart cat. Mei told Hitoshi and Hitoshi was beaming and opened his arms for Izuku. Izuku leaped into Hitoshi's arms. That is incredible. Fumikage reached and gently ran his finger across Izuku's head. I know this will make things much easier for you no longer needing to track down Kudo or Nenzu. Huh. You bet. Izuku purred when Fumikage scratched the sides of his face and under his chin. We should have done this eons ago. I agree, thank you, Meh. Itoshi told her and she nodded. I wish you the best of luck. See you guys when you need something. She told them while Fumikage and Hitoshi walked out of the lab. I do wish it wasn't so. Muzzle why? But it's still incredible, Hitoshi mumbled as he inspected the translator a little more in detail. It'll take some getting used to, Izuku said through the translator. But I'm excited. He jumped a little as he got on Hitoshi's shoulder. Yeah, I am too. Going back to the dorms was fun. The moment they walked through the doors Izuku took a deep breath and spoke. Hello, hey Achako, who was walking by. Answered him stopped and whipped back around to look at Izuku and Hitoshi with wide eyes. Was, was that she pointed at Izuku and Hitoshi nodded. Yep. We got him a translator, so he can speak with the rest of us without us having to bug Kudo or Nenzu. Itoshi explained and then Izuku spoke. It freaked me out at first, but it's pretty handy now. Achako's eyes just stayed wide. Well, I just never knew you could speak so dot 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 well. She told him as she stepped up to Izuku. That's incredible. She then patted Izuku's head gently. Then again, if you're smart enough to telepathically speak with Hitoshi then obviously you'd speak well. Still, this is great. I'm glad you'll be able to speak with the rest of us. Izuku purred while Achako patted him. It was going to do a handy device for sure. One that would make life a lot easier for the rest of them. Hitoshi would get his answer about going to see his mother on Friday night during dinner. I'm going to be going with you guys. Aburo told him in a gentle tone at the table. Moss was laying a ways away while Pumpkin and Brian demanded his attention by demanding he play with them. Moss clearly didn't feel like playing as when Pumpkin batted him he just fell to his side and stayed there. I don't want you to inconvenience yourself, Hitoshi told Aburo as he looked away from Moss and back to his foster father. Not really an inconvenience in all honesty. I wasn't doing much and I have PTO time to use anyways. So, I'm taking tomorrow off and still getting paid, Aburo explained. Besides, we really don't want you without a hero at this point, Shouta explained while he quietly slurped his noodle. Mai seems to know your every move and we don't want to risk another kidnapping. Hitoshi nodded. I understand. We'll be with other people though. Dabai is just an adult, not a hero, Toga isn't a hero, and Shoto doesn't even have his license. Hazashi pointed out fairly quickly and that made Hitoshi nod in agreement. You're right. Plus, Aburo trailed off and swallowed thickly. We dot 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 also want to meet your mother. But all three of us can't meet her, so, I'll go. Aburo then smiled. We just want to make sure she's not going to be like Iri's mother is all. Yeah, that's fair as well. Hitoshi whispered. Iri came up to him and sat in his lap without an invite. Hitoshi wrapped his arms around her and smiled while placing his chin on her head. Can I come? She inquired while kicking her legs. I'd like to meet your mommy. Sorry, sweetie, maybe next time. Hitoshi told her because truthfully he didn't know how his mother was going to be. If she would even remember him but she should. Maybe. Iri did give a little pout but didn't protest much further than that. Also, we'll take another car. 
Maybe a van to fit all of us. Aburo hummed as he thought about it. I just know that the car Taoya has is rather tiny. Hitoshi liked the idea and gave a nod of approval still he felt a little confused. I mean there's only five of us not counting Moss because he can just sit in my lap. Speaking of Moss Hitoshi looked over at his friend. Brian, Brat, and Pumpkin were all trying to get Mr. Lazabones up. Brian was pulling on Izuku's ear. Brat was physically trying to push him and Pumpkin was pulling at the new collar but Moss wasn't having it. He wasn't going to move. Shouta spoke next while he finished his plate. 6. Bakugo is coming with you guys. Bakugo. Itoshi looked back at Shouta. Shouta nodded. Yeah. He heard about where Todoroki was going and he wanted to go to visit his aunt. Izuku's ear twitched and he poked his head up. This wasn't lost on Shouta as he looked at Moss. Yes, he's going to see your mother, Shouta told the cat. Wait, Inko Midoriya goes there as well. Itoshi asked in surprise while he shifted Iri a little. Yeah, she does. Shouta then got up and brought his dish to the sink. The subject dropped shortly after that as Hitoshi put Iri to the ground and brought his dish to the sink and washed it. He was quiet as he let his mind wander at the idea of meeting his own mother and Inko Midori. What if Inko approached him? What could we say to her? When Hitoshi and Izuku returned to the dorm, Hitoshi put Izuku on the bed and Izuku just flopped over with a ha. All right, talk to me. Hitoshi turned the translator on and it quickly sprang to life and wrapped around Izuku's head and mouth. What's the matter? He asked. Hitoshi started to strip out of his clothes to get into sleeping clothes and while he did this Izuku spoke. Nothing. Did you know your mother was in that facility? I knew she was in a facility. Hitoshi looked back at Izuku and saw him laying there with his ears back. I guess. I just don't know how I feel about seeing her again after all of this time. Izuku admitted as he gave a deep sigh and then just looked at the ceiling with a slow exhale. I hope she's doing well. While Hitoshi wiggled into a pair of sleeping shorts and kept his shirt off. I'm sure she's doing better. He told Izuku before he got into bed. It's going to be okay. She won't even know it's you. I know and that's what makes me a little sad. Izuku admitted and Hitoshi picked him up and held Izuku to his chest. It's gonna be okay. Do you want to sit out tomorrow? No, I want to be there for you. Izuku said while resting his head on Hitoshi's chest and then gave a soft purr. Hitoshi smiled while he ran his fingers through Izuku's fur. I'm glad you're going to be there with me. Hitoshi whispered as he exhaled a slow breath and Izuku rubbed his head under Hitoshi's chin. Hitoshi smiled and turned the translator off. The translator retracted and Izuku was able to rest a little more comfortably. Hitoshi gave a smile. I love you, buddy. Izuku gave a mew. I love you, too. The next day Hitoshi and Izuku woke early. They ate breakfast with the other early birds and Hitoshi looked at Nito. You good, man? Hitoshi inquired as he ate his toast. You look about half dead. Nito did look rather tired. No doubt it was because of his extra training that All Might was putting him under now that his work study was over and done with. He had eye bags that rivaled Hitoshi's. His skin was slightly pale, and his usually kempt hair was pulled back by a head. I'm fine, he said as he grabbed the coffee pot and they watched him. Now they expected him to do the logical thing and pour himself a glass. The madman tipped the pot directly into his mouth. You can't just do that. Ada yelled as he chopped a hand toward an uncaring Nito. Nito chugged the entire pot of coffee not caring at the dropped jaws and looks of concern aimed his way. The last drop of coffee was gone and Nito returned the pot to the sink. Washed it, put new coffee grounds in the maker, and then started a new pot of coffee. Well, I'm out. You guys have fun today. Nito gave a tired yawn before taking off still ignoring their looks of concern. Did that just happen? Momo blinked and Hitoshi nodded. It did. Should we ask if he needs help? Momo inquired and Hitoshi looked back where Nito was before shaking his head. I think. He'll come to us in due time. For now, though let's make sure he's comfortable whenever he comes back in the dorms. I have a feeling that caffeine crash is going to hit him like a semi-truck. Itoshi told her as he finished off his breakfast. Momo nodded. You're right. Oh here, I meant to give some of this to Moss. With her elbow, she made a small tin of cat food. I looked up the ingredients and it looked like something he would enjoy. Thanks. Itoshi took the can and popped the tab open with ease. He then set the tin on the table and Moss jumped up to eat. Moss wasted no time digging into it. This did make Kuda frown a little as he watched this. Hitoshi rubbed his hand down Izuku's back as his friend continued to eat at a pretty fast rate. I take it he likes it. Kuda's hand was like a whip. It shot out and snatched the can of food that Izuku got about halfway done with. Izuku gave a confused mew and Kuda inhaled a deep breath, his cheeks red before he finally spoke in a stern voice to Hitoshi. You shouldn't let him eat that ma. The others are right. He is getting bigger than at his size should be. I understand you love him, but you're hurting him. It's not all her. I and tell with the way his stomach droops. Kuda then picked Izuku up by his underarms and presented his stomach to Hitoshi. It's hard to really see with all of his her but I I push it down a little here. Kuda pushed the fur down gently to show that maybe Izuku did have a bit of a tummy. He was at an ideal weight Bayor the at gang and when we got him back he slowly started gaining weight. 
You're overeating him, Hitoshi. Kuda told him matter-of-factly and then he put Izuku back down. Izuku's tail whipped a little. I've also noted that you never let him walk anymore. He just sits on your shoulder and he doesn't exercise that much either. Damn, so, I'll be taking this. Kuda said matter-of-factly as he took the can and walked off. Damn, Hitoshi whispered as he and Izuku looked at each other. I guess I have been feeding you a bit since getting you back. You usually hunt for yourself but, thinking about it, Hitoshi realized he didn't exactly go light on the treats and just now with the canned food he usually lets Izuku finish the can if he buys canned cat food. You do like to be my parrot more often than not now. Izuku's ears went back as he looked away from Hitoshi. And the other day you didn't exactly want to get up when the others wanted to play. Maybe a diet is needed. Izuku looked down at his own stomach and gently patted it with his paw. Perhaps I should shed a few pounds. He thought to himself. Hey Todoroki came downstairs and looked at Hitoshi and Izuku. You guys ready? We're leaving now. He inquired and Hitoshi nodded while picking Moss up. Moss let out a mew while Hitoshi walked up to Todoroki. Seconds later Bakugo was with them as he descended the steps. Izuku, who was being held like a briefcase, started to move his feet like he was running. He obviously didn't go anywhere as Hitoshi just kept a hold of him. Finally, he was noticed and Hitoshi put him down. Izuku immediately jumped on Bakugo's shoulder and the other just sighed. Well, it's funny, as they were getting ready to leave the dorms, Izuku was suddenly grabbed by Kuda and placed firmly on the ground. You should walk. Izuku snorted but complied as he trotted along with Bakugo. When they were outside they were greeted by Taoya and Toga. The two of them waved in greeting. Taoya didn't have his mask on and without the mask, Izuku could see the resemblance between Taoya and Shoto. Cat. Toga didn't give Izuku a chance to run as she snatched him by his vest and held him to her chest. Hi, Mossy. She cooed while rocking back and forth. Izuku gave a purr as he rubbed under her chin. Such a gentleman. Oh, I could eat you. Toga actually snapped her teeth at him making Izuku's eyes go wide and his ears go back. Toga then laughed when it became clear that Izuku wasn't the only one looking at her with that same scared expression. Lighten up, I'm joking. She told them all with a little laugh. They would relax a little more at that. Aburo came to them and they got ready to officially leave. They took a decently sized SUV that was able to hold all of them and off they went for the facility. Izuku sat in Hitoshi's lap and rested his head on Hitoshi's chest. Izuku allowed his eyes to shut while he needed his paws against Hitoshi's chest not really seeing or feeling Hitoshi wince in discomfort. Izuku purred as he continued to need Hitoshi's chest. Everyone was talking and Izuku felt himself lulled into a quick cat nap. Just, a quick nap to pass the time as everyone spoke. The vibe in the car was pretty high in all honesty. Everyone was either goofing around or just having a casual conversation. Itoshi watched as Toga dramatically draped herself over the back of the front seat and tried to convenience Aburo to get McDonald. Aburo refused. Bakugo, who was sandwiched between Hitoshi and Shoto was shouting at Taoya the two of them apparently getting into a disagreement because Taoya mentioned liking baby metal, which got Bakugo all sorts of fired up. Shoto was just sitting and staring quietly out of the window. It all made Hitoshi smile as he looked down at Moss. Moss was still clinging to his shirt, his claws extended and gripping Hitoshi's shirt tightly. His breathing was rhythmic and easy and Hitoshi only watched before choosing to look out the window as well. Then, before he even knew it, Aburo pulled into the parking lot of the facility. He turned and faced them all. You will all be quiet and respectful once in here, understand? He told them all in a stern tone. And of course, everyone agreed. Hitoshi woke Moss with a small shake and Moss gave a sleepy MRRP. Upon being woken, Moss stretched himself out, finally releasing Hitoshi's shirt from his claws as he did so. Come on, sleepyhead. Hitoshi whispered as he slid out of the SUV once the seats before him were lowered. Once Hitoshi was freed he put Moss on his shoulder out of reflex and then stretched himself out as well. This included his wings which he accidentally smacked Bakugo in the face with. I'll kill you. Bakugo roared in anger and he was promptly grabbed by the ear by Aburo. Quiet and respectful, Aburo reminded Bakugo sternly. Apologies. Bakugo grumbled while he rubbed his ear once Aburo released him. Watch those wings. Bakugo hissed to Hitoshi and Hitoshi only nodded as he made sure his wings were tucked away firmly against his back. Before going in, Hitoshi fixed his hair by redoing his ponytail. He wanted to make sure his hair wasn't all over the place. He was the last in as he looked at the hospital name and then shut his eyes. After all these years, I finally get to meet her. He whispered to himself. He felt Moss nudge his head under his cheek and smiled. Let's do this. I wonder if she'll even recognize me or if I'll recognize her. Hitoshi walked inside the facility. He was the last one to do so. They were, as stated, quiet and respectful once the threshold was crossed. There you are. Aburo gave a sigh and ushered Hitoshi towards him. The Todorokis and Toga all had cards around their necks. Visitor passes no doubt. Bakugo was talking to the receptionist and the woman was taking his information down with ease. 
Aburo put his hands on Hitoshi's shoulders. She's here. They confirmed your mother's name. Are you ready? Aburo inquired and Hitoshi looked at Moss. Moss nodded and that made Hitoshi nod back. I am. Aburo led Hitoshi to the desk once Bakugo got his visitor pass. The woman was all smiles as the two of them approached. Wow, loud cloud, I'm such a fan. The woman told him and Aburo smiled back. Always nice to meet a fan. We're here to see a Kiko Shinsu. Aburo got right to the chase as he kept a grip on Hitoshi's shoulders. The woman kept her smile as she asked questions. Who were they in relation to her? And if was Moss actually certified once everything was in order they too were given visitor passes. It was weird. It was just a cheap lanyard with a piece of paper hanging from it but it felt so heavy around his neck. They walked towards the doors where a nurse had to put in a code for them and before they knew it their little ragtag group were all in the cafeteria. Some people gave them looks but most didn't look up from their food. Hitoshi scanned the area. He looked for Akiko Shinzu. But, he didn't see her. Then again, he didn't know what she looked like God. He was an idiot. Feeling eyes on him. Hitoshi turned his head in that direction. He met eyes with a woman with dark green eyes and green hair. She wore a simple too big tank top and sweatpants. The woman quickly looked away when their eyes met. Maybe that's my mo. Before he finished the thought, before he took that first step, his face was smacked by moss. Not once, not even three times, but five times his loyal cat and best friend smacked him. What moss? Hitoshi demanded and moss just shook his head. How could you possibly before Hitoshi could finish his sentence? Bakugo sat down across from the lady. Hello, auntie. He greeted her and then seemed to stare at Hitoshi out of the corner of his eye. Oh, Hitoshi whispered in realization. That's, he looked back down at Moss and dot 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 yeah. Now that he thought about it she did share some qualities with Nai's or rather Izuku. Still, Moss nodded. Wow, she's really pretty. Moss nodded in agreement. Hitoshi, maybe, don't have conversations with Moss in the middle of the cafeteria. Aburo whispered as he gently grabbed Hitoshi's arms and leaned down. We don't need you admit it. Oop. Hitoshi whispered back before clearing his throat. Sorry, Papa. And he focused away from Moss for the time being. They all looked around the cafeteria. Taoya was hugging his mom while Toga gushed and Shoto remained seating and looked quite pleased with himself. Bakugo was talking to Inko quietly, but Inko's eyes would often wander back toward Hitoshi and Moss. They said she was here, Hitoshi whispered to Aburo. But, he shook his head. I don't remember a thing about her. Well dot 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 did and say it was Shoto that found her. Ask Shoto what she looks like, Aburo suggested in. Hitoshi felt like an idiot. I swear I'm smart. He grumbled before trudging off towards where Shoto was sitting. He didn't want to bug him visiting his mother but it was important. A man passed them and Hitoshi watched the man for a second. The man had a plate of food in his hands as he walked over and sat with Inko and Bakugo. Inko looked happy as she introduced the man to Bakugo. Hitoshi focused back on the task at hand. With his hands shoved into his pockets he sauntered up to Shoto. Oh, this must be your friend Hitoshi Shinsu. Mrs. Todoroki said with a pleasant smile on her face right as Hitoshi tried to discreetly step up to Shoto. Hitoshi froze for a moment before he bowed politely to Mrs. Todoroki. Pleasure to meet you, madam, he said and nearly sent Moss toppling over his shoulder as a result. Mrs. Todoroki kept the smile on her face. Hitoshi saw a hand out of the corner of his eye and quickly, more out of reflex than anything, he turned taking a step back from the stranger trying to touch him. Well, he never got a look at the person. The person had been wearing a grey hoodie and they had the hood up and their head down. They swerved away from Hitoshi almost dramatically as they scurried away hurriedly. Hitoshi watched them go and Mrs. Todoroki's smile wavered a bit and she swallowed thickly before she garnered his attention once more. Shoto has told me a lot about you, young man. I'm glad you're adjusting to such a drastic quirk. Excuse me Mrs. Midoriya's voice rang through and Hitoshi watched as she too scurried away in the exact same direction as the stranger. Hitoshi watched them go before Moss suddenly jumped off of his shoulder and went to follow his mother. Moss. Hitoshi started to call him back, and to his credit, Moss did stop and look back at him. It was like he was daring Hitoshi in those few seconds they stared at one another. Don't get lost, was all Hitoshi had to say and Moss took off after his mother. Hitoshi then turned back to Todoroki's. Apologies, he bowed the woman. Thank you for your concern. Shoto has told me a bit about you as well. Kikayo, shut it, get out. Kikayo demanded as she pointed towards the door where Inko was now leaning against. I don't want to hear it, I don't need your pity. Kikayo spat while she lowered her hood and ran and vigorously ran her fingers through her purple hair as she started to pace. Kikayo, get out what? Kikayo bemoaned before she fell face down on her bed. He doesn't recognize me anyways. It's best I just stay a memory. I was a horrible mother anyways. Kikayo, Inko was gentle as she stepped into Kikayo's room and then sat down on the edge of Kikayo's bed. She ran her fingers through the other woman's lilac hair in a comforting way. It came here looking for you. You know that and I know that. Why else would he be here? To see Ray? I don't think so. He was looking around because he was looking for you. 
Your son wants to meet you. Kikaya whined and rubbed her face against her pillow. He's not my son. Where did the wings come from? He's supposed to be a brainwasher. Last I checked I didn't give birth to a bird. Kikayo yelled to Inko. Kikayo. Inko gave her a warning tone. Remember what Shino told us. He was kidnapped and his quirk was taken. He was given the wings by a villain. We both know that was Hitoshi and Rei even confirmed it for you. Kikayo groaned like a teenager and slammed her face back into her pillows. Just go on without me. She whispered. He clearly already has a parent that's doing a better job than I ever could. Inko sighed as she stood from the bed and started to walk towards the door. But not before a flash of anger shot down her spine and she spun back around. You don't understand how lucky you have it, Kikayo. Your son wants to see and meet you for the first time in what? 15 maybe 16 years. My son will never come back. My son was turned into a monster if what Shino told us was true. I would give anything to be in your shoes right now. Then with those final and harsh words, she turned her heel and walked out of Kikayo's room. Inko turned sharply down the hall. Her breath caught in her throat and she put her hand on her chest as she found herself staring down at Itoshi's cat. The cat with those familiar emerald-colored eyes. They just stared at one another. Neither wanted to break the silence. The cat was slow and methodical like he. Inko looked down. Yes he, he was watching her wanting to see what she was going to do. To gauge her reaction. Inko's throat suddenly became dry as she then licked her lips and was the first to look away. If you're looking for a litter box dot 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 we don't have those here so. Was the smartest thing she could think to say at that moment. The cat just continued to stare at her with those eyes. Those familiar eyes. Mom. Little Izuku yelled as he pulled her frantically towards the computer. Let's go. Those eyes. Were they. Tearing up. The cat actually had tears in his eyes and he used his paws to wipe them away the best he could. Momas. That's what that boy called you. Right. Inko inquired as she slowly felt herself crouch down at Sutsu. She then extended her hand toward him. Unlike most cats, Moss didn't give her a sniff. No, he first pressed his head against her palm and Inko felt a familiar warmth from it before the cat held onto her wrist with both of his paws. He didn't bunny kick, didn't get on his back. He just held her hand there. Now why was she starting to tear up? Oh, she knew why. She recognized her baby anywhere. Inko's vision blurred with tears as her throat started to hurt. She tried to suppress her sobs as she wiped her tears sloppily with her free hand. Still, she had to be sure. I Izuku, is, is it you, or am I finally losing it? She asked with a heavy tearful voice while trying to wipe her tears the best she could. That cat nodded the cat fucking nodded. Inko couldn't hold back anymore. She picked Izuku up quickly and hugged him tightly. Th the moment I saw you in in a picture. She sobbed into his fur. The the moment she sniffled against him. It just felt way too good to be true. She pressed something by accident. She felt the button on the collar push in and she nearly dropped Izuku in shock when the collar sprang to life and wrapped around his head and face. He didn't seem bothered by this at all. Mooooom. Izuku wailed an electronic voice speaking for him. Inko sobbed into the green fur. Izuku. Oh, Izuku. She knew if any orderly saw her she'd be wheeled away and put into emergency therapy. Hell, if anyone saw her right now she'd look insane. There was a purring and Inko sniffled before wiping her nose with her arm. I don't understand. She yelled between sobs. I don't I saw you I saw your body I. I. Her voice failed her. Her thoughts failed her. She didn't know what to say or what to think anymore. Boss, Abara walked down the hallway but stopped when he saw dot 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 will dot 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 this. Inko felt afraid. She was going to be locked away forever. This man was going to think she was nuts. Or, maybe not it would seem. Abara walked up to them and crouched down. You couldn't have waited to tell her. He asked the cat before he reached up and stroked Izuku's head. No, Izuku said firmly. I didn't tell her, she figured it out. You, you know. Inko whispered and Hitoshi nodded. Yeah, I do. You have a good son, Mrs. Midoriya. We've been taking care of him for the last few years. Aburo explained to her in a soft tone. We would have brought him sooner but we just weren't sure if you would have understood. I don't understand. I buried him. I. She held Izuku just a little tighter. The thing is, from what we managed to piece together he's not Izuku. But he still has Izuku's memories. It was dumbed down for her benefit no doubt but she did understand it if only a tad. Inko could stay there in that hallway holding Izuku forever. She really could have but life was funny. There was a thunderous crash from the cafeteria one never heard before as the whole building shook to its very core. Inko let out a yelp as she held on to Izuku and Aburo was quick to stand. There were screams of terror and people took running down the hallways scattering like ants. Itoshi, Aburo yelled and he went towards the cafeteria. Inko's legs moved before her brain could and she chased after the man with Izuku still in her arms. When they got to the cafeteria there were already blocks of ice signaling either Rei or her son went on the offensive. Well, both were standing with Taoya having pushed the blonde girl behind him. The area looked like a bomb had gone off. There was clearly a hole through one of the windows and wall. There was glass everywhere, tables overturned, blood on the ground, and bodies laying still. 
The hole was where the ice barrier was. Auntie, Pak Hugo grabbed her and Steven was beside her in an instant as well. Inko looked around and spotted Hitoshi. Hitoshi had been in the blast radius as he was laying unconscious under an overturned table. Aburo was rushing to get him out. We have to go. Steven urged her while others still scrambled to flee. Dot 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 flee from what exactly? Well, she would find out in seconds when a thing crashed through the ice barrier they had created. It was massive. It didn't look human because it wasn't and it had blue skin. Its brain was out and pulsating. Its eyes were bugged and looking in every direction. It had a scrawny backside but its fists more than made up for that as it walked on its knuckles like a gorilla. The thing looked wildly around before it spotted Inko. Much like a gorilla, it bashed its fists into the ground like it was getting ready to charge while it let out a shriek straight from hell. Easy there, Namo. A new, familiar voice spoke from the ice barrier as a hand came out and patted Namo's arm. Inko felt faint as the figure emerged and she looked down at Izuku in her arms. Dot 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 then dot 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 she looked back at the monster, at what Shino was warning her about. At Izuku's reanimated body. This was a bad situation to be in. A bad one. Inko held on tightly to Izuku, while this monster with her baby's face focused on her. Mom, it's been so long. The faker took a few steps towards her, his arms open wide like he was expecting a hug. Well, Ray was faster than anyone. The woman put herself between Inko and this. This. Thing. This looked like Izuku. Yes, but there are some things that made him look completely different from Inko's baby. His skin was too gray when he was grinning his teeth were too sharp. His eye wasn't even the right color or the right pupil for that matter. He looked like someone was just wearing Izuku's skin and that. That scared her. Inko's throat felt dry as she shook and nearly dropped the actual Izuku in her arms. Oh, the monster before her looked at Ray in surprise. You're outnumbered. Ray told him while her hands started to ice frost up and the air became cold. Taoya and Shoto both got on either side of Nai's their own powers activating and warning. Aburo was by Hitoshi's unconscious body and he too looked ready to use his quirk. But it became clear, at least to Inko, he was forming a plan in his mind. Katsuki grabbed Inko and pushed him back so now there were two people between the fake Izuku and her. Inko felt herself tear up for almost no reason. Well, maybe there was a reason. This wasn't her baby. Just his corpse. Nice. Katsuki growled. A faker. Nice tilted his head as he looked at Katsuki. If anything he looked rather impressed that Katsuki was here. You know, I only came here for my mother but, seeing how that cat is already here. Nice pointed at Izuku in Inko's arms and Inko quickly shielded her baby from Nice's gaze. I'll be taking him. No, Inko hissed softly as she crouched down a bit and held on to Izuku even tighter. Nice frowned at this denial. That wasn't a suggestion. Nice told her and took a daring step forward. I will be taking the cat one way or another. No, you won't. Katsuki hissed as he looked over his shoulder at Izuku. Inko saw it in Katsuki's eyes. He knew. His hands started to glow a bright orange but he didn't pop off any of his explosions just yet. Izuku wiggled against his mother's hold, but she wouldn't let him go. She just got him back. Nice gave a sudden grin. A devilish grin that made him look straight up demonic as his grin stretched across his cheeks. Oh, there was an inflection in his voice that made Inko shiver in fear while she kept her hold on Izuku. Izuku was looking up at her, the muzzle-like thing still around his mouth but he said nothing. Oh, Nice then started to laugh. He laughed like it was all one big giant joke while he pointed at Katsuki. Now you want to be the hero. Now you want to protect him. Where was this Katsuki in middle school? Don't, Katsuki told him. Don't. Inko felt her eyebrows knit in confusion as she looked at Katsuki in confusion. What does he mean by that? Steven was cautious as he gently grabbed Inko's arm and kept her close to him. Nice kept that sickly grin on his face as he tilted his head to the side. Oh, this is just so dot 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 cute. He never told you. Nice cackled and brought his hands to the sides of his face as he continued to grin and laugh like a maniac. Katsuki dot 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 what is he talking about? Inko turned a little to face him as a frown etched itself across her features. Katsuki grew grim as he looked away from her, unable to look at her anymore. I, I'm sorry. He apologized before he told her what he did dot 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 not a good sign. What's the matter, Kakin? Nice inquired in a childish mocking voice. Can't own up to the consequences of your actions. For your information, I was four. It happened suddenly. First Katsuki was lively as he spoke aggressively to Nice before his eyes became milky white and his jaw went slack while his shoulders slumped. Nice was grinning like the cat that caught the canary. Now that I have you like this, why don't you tell my mother the truth? What did you say to me the day I jumped off the roof? What were your final words to me that faithful day? Stop it. Izuku yelled loudly which made Steven and Ray look at the cat with wide eyes. Izuku struggled against Inko's grip but she just couldn't bring herself to let go of her son. She couldn't. Stop it. It doesn't matter anymore. Nice's face turned nasty. There you go again. Forgiving the unforgivable. He gnashed his sharp teeth together so hard that they clicked loudly. Tell them, tell them all here and now, Nice demanded. Then Katsuki spoke in a slow drawl. 
I told you to there was a flash as a cloud swept Katsuki off of his feet and woke him from Nise's quirk it seemed as he let out a gasp. Katsuki was brought to Loud Cloud and the man had a broken metal pipe in his hands. That's enough. Loud Cloud growled as he directed the pipe at Nise. You have terrorized my students and my family long enough. I may be off duty, but I'm still a hero, and backup is on the way which includes almost all of the UA staff. Okay, Nice smiled before he jumped up into the air and landed gracefully on the Nama's shoulder. If it's a fight you want, Loud Cloud, I'm not opposed to one. But this area is quite small and my Namu is quite big. Nice patted the Namu's face almost lovingly. I worked hard with the doctor to make the perfect Namu, you see. There are still people in this room. Not just your students, your villains turn good, but civilians. Look around you. Look at all the people still here. Are you going to put their lives at risk? I mean, who knows who my Nama will trample? It could be her he pointed at Ray and both Talia and Shoto's flames grew in their hands. Him he pointed at Steven and Enko tightened her hand on Steven's sleeve while he held onto her a little tighter. Or even he didn't say. He just pointed directly at Hitoshi's unconscious body. Aburo licked his lips almost nervously as he looked at Hitoshi then back at Nice. His mouth then twisted in anger. I thought he was your best friend. I thought you'd never harm him. I'm over that. You see, after I got Hitoshi's quirk for my own eyes crossed one leg over the other as he leaned back a bit and just smiled. The fixings the doctor and my father did miraculously stopped as in I put a stop to them. I'm no longer confined. I'm allowed to finally be myself and, you know what I realized. I really don't care for anybody anymore. I only want one thing. Nice then pointed at Izuku and Inko's arms. That cat's quirk and I was given a better quirk. On top of that girl's shapeshifting. I can now take any quirk as long as I make contact with the host. In the middle of this monologue, that girl as nice called her came jumping at him, a piece of jagged glass clasped tightly in her hands, so tightly that one of her hands was already bleeding. With a scream from her mouth, she went to attack. She was swiftly grabbed in one of the Namu's mighty hands in midair. Toga, Taoya screamed as the Namu had her by the neck. Very quickly her face started to turn a shade of purple as her oxygen was cut off. She tried desperately to stab the Namu with her piece of glass but all she managed to do was break the glass into the Namu's mighty arm and that was quickly healed. Do it? Nyes looked Taoya dead in the eyes with a crazed look as his grin stayed plastered on his face. I'll snap her neck. Don't think I won't. As Nyes shouted at Taoya it was the perfect distraction for Shoto. Shoto stomped on the ground and a glacier appeared and wrapped tightly around the Namu's massive arm stopping it from squeezing any farther. Taoya, Shoto shouted and Taoya shot out a bright blue flame aimed directly at Nyes. Nyes leaped off of his beloved Namu swiftly and jumped into the air. The moment he was on the ground Ray struck using her hands she slammed both on the ground and made a glacier wrap tightly around Nyes. You're dead, right? So the cold shouldn't be good on those already stiff limbs of yours. Ray growled as she stood. Nyes was completely engulfed by the ice. The only part of him sticking out of the cold was his head as he immediately looked panicked he looked more like Izuku while he struggled against Ray's ice and even then the onslaught wasn't done as the moment Ray stood Aburo struck before Nyes could command his Namu to do anything. The metal pipe Aburo had struck Nyes straight across the face and head. His head whipped to the side as he let out a loud cry. Then dot 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 just like that he went limp in the ice and everyone let out a breath. Inko slowly fell to the ground as she stared at the corpse, the corpse of her son and then she looked down at Izuku before she hugged him tightly and started to cry into his fur. Everything just hit her at once. Jesus. Steven crouched down and ran his hand through Inko's hair. Are you okay, dear? Steven asked and Inko. Just cried. How could she be okay? She felt a rough tongue lick her cheek and she looked at Izuku in her arms. People started to evacuate a little faster now and sirens could be heard in the distance. It seemed everything may just be okay. The smell of cooking meat and the feeling of heat on her face made Inko look up, only to immediately look away. Talia and Shoto were burning the Namu's hand off of Toga's neck. The Namu had gone silent now that Nyes was incapacitated. There was a sickening sound of the Namu's hand falling to the ground as the beast let out a shriek of pain but did not retaliate. Toga hit the ground and let out several wheezing breaths as gasped violently. Idiot! Talia yelled at her before hugging her tightly against his chest. Oh God! came Hitoshi's voice as he finally seemed to have returned to them. Oh God, he cried in alarm at the destruction, at Nyes, and at the giant Namu. Inko looked at Hitoshi and then looked down at Izuku. Izuku looked at her and she smiled a sad and watery smile. For just that moment everything seemed like it would all be perfectly okay. That everything was. Good. Until it wasn't. They had all let their guards down for just a second too long. It was Shoto that had gotten just a little too close to Nyes. He wasn't even interested in Nyes, he had gone to check on Hitoshi. Like a rabid dog, Nyes sprung back to life and chomped on Shoto's arm. Ah, uh, Shoto jerked his arm free from Nyes's maw and by then it was way too late. 
Nai started to morph into Shoto Todoroki, taking on his clothes and likeness as well as his quirks. The ice first started to glow orange before it exploded from the sheer amount of pressure Nai's used to free himself. Nai's then stood there looking exactly like Shoto Todoroki as he grinned and then he looked towards Inko and stared directly at her. I will be taking that cat from you, mother. He told her in a threatening tone while pointing. Something inside Inko strengthened as she held on to Izuku and stared at Nai's. She tightened her hold on the cat before she turned and she ran. Her feet moved before her mind did. She kept Izuku close to her chest as she ran down the hallway as fast as her legs could carry her. She nearly tripped on an overturned cart but managed to stay on her feet. She could only hear her own breathing roaring in her ears as she ran down the lonely hallway. For a moment, for just a moment she thought maybe the monster wasn't going to follow. She was right. Kinda. Nice did not follow her. The Namu did. Like an angry gorilla, it crashed through the hallway, using its massive arms to slam through anything in its path and it was a race. Inko charged through the hallway as she could hear and feel the Namu getting closer and closer with each second. Mom, Izuku spoke as he clung to her. Give me to him. It's not worth it. It is, Izuku. You are worth it. Inko yelled madly as tears threatened to blur his vision while she ran. The Namu was getting closer and closer. Its massive fist shook the whole hallway, causing the windows to rattle and the building to quake in its fury. Inko looked behind her and just see a white and purple blur kick the Namu in the face. Itoshi's mighty wings flapped as he grabbed onto the Namu's face and started kicking at it in an attempt to try and slow it down. It wouldn't be long before Katsuki joined him and with one powerful explosion he aimed right from the Namu's left eye to blind it. Inko looked forward again as she charged down the hallway. She didn't know just where she was going as she passed all the rooms. She didn't even know where this section of the facility led to. Was suddenly grabbed and yanked towards a stairwell by Kikayo. This way, Kikayo demanded and the two women ran up the stairs frantically. The Namu skidded and tried to follow. But for once luck was on their side as the stairwell was just too small and the walls were reinforced. The Namu tried to reach one of its massive hands inside but couldn't reach Inko's retreating form. The beast gave a roar at this. A roar that completely shook Inko to her core, but she couldn't stop. She couldn't. Hurry, Kikayo urged as she grabbed Inko's wrist and the two of them ran toward the second floor where the door was. I know where a fire escape is. We can Kikayo reached for the door and turn the handle just pop the screen out. It's an employee lounge. There's a password but it's stupidly simple it had happened suddenly as Kikayo was explaining a hand shot out from the open door and wrapped around her throat. Kikayo kicked and screamed as Shoto Todoroki no knives had her in his harsh and unforgiving grip. Oh dot 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 how cute. Nice grinned as he looked at Kikayo. That quirk you have. Something black was invading Kikayo's body through her neck where Nyes had her in his grip. Mind control. Oh yes, I see it now. You're Hydish's mother. Tsk tsk. Nyes pulled her arm back as Kikayo tried and failed to kick her off. How horrible. He commented on the old needle marks on her arms. You know, there was an unmistakable hatred in Nyes's eyes, despite them being Shoto's eyes. He was staring down at Kikayo, as the woman tried to fight him the best she could. She kicked and clawed, but nothing she did worked. I think Hidashi will do just fine with you in his life. Izuku was quick as he managed to slip out of his mother's grasp and charged at Nais. Izuku jumped right against Nais's face to throw him off balance. With him being such a heavy cat it wasn't hard. Kikayo let out a gasp as she was let go and Inko watched in horror as Kikayo rolled down the stairs. There wasn't a single doubt in Inko's mind that Kikayo knee tore at one point. Inko watched as Kikayo's right knee twisted when she went down. Kikayo. Thankfully Kikayo was still out of the Namu's reach but the beast was still trying to get through. Motherfucker. Kikayo screamed from the ground before she started to cry loudly and grab her knee. That fucking hurt. Kikayo. 12,341,234. Kikayo shouted loudly at Inko, stopping her decent down the stairs. What? The fucking passcode. It's 12,341,234. I told you it's stupidly simple. Get your cat and fucking bolt. Inko bristled. I'm not going to leave you. You are. Do you know why? Because that thing. She pointed up to where Nais and Izuku were still fighting. And that thing. She pointed at the Namu that was being pelted with explosions if the noises outside the room were anything to go by. Or after that fucking cat that you want to protect. You leave this building with that cat they'll leave. So you run, you run and you don't you dare look back. I don't know why you want to risk your life for a cat but I'm not going to judge because we're all a bunch of not rights. Now go. Inko listened to Kikayo's words before she looked up and her quirk surged beneath her skin. Nice had Izuku by his vest Izuku was fighting, wiggling, and squirming, trying everything to get away. Nice's mouth was wide open. Those sharp teeth looking particularly sharp at that moment he's going to eat my baby. Inko charged the stairs at a fast speed. She outstretched both of her hands and her quirk caused Izuku to jerk towards her. Her quirk felt more powerful than ever as Izuku flew to her at a fast rate. 
Izuku slammed into her arms the moment she made it to the top of the stairs. Nais, who was clearly shocked only just realized how close they were, and Ko didn't hesitate she couldn't hesitate. She slammed her foot into the back of his leg and sent the imposter to his back. This gave her only a few precious seconds, seconds she didn't waste. And Ko ran. Thankfully on the top floor, there was only one direction to go. Mother, Nai screamed in rage as he got to his feet. And Ko's heart was roaring through her ears as she looked for the door with the passcode lock on it. The one that would be labeled employees only. Hopefully, don't you want to see me again? Live again, just give me the cat. Why are you being difficult? Nyes was asking questions. A lot of questions and Izuku informed her why seconds later. Don't answer any of his questions. Don't respond to him. He has Hitoshi's brainwashing. It's how he got Kaken earlier. Inko nodded at Izuku and kept her mouth screwed shut. Nyes was gaining on them but coming up. Inko saw it, the passcode lock. She nearly overshot it as she slid right in front of it and almost fell as a hole. With trembling fingers, she punched in the stupid passcode. 12,341,234 and hit the green button. The door unlocked and Inko slipped in and slammed the door shut just in the nick of time. There was an angry pounding on the other side followed by Nyes's scream of rage. Nyes slammed both hands on the door before he dragged his nails down the door making a horrifying noise. Screech. It scared Inko to her very core. I thought you were my mother. I thought you wanted me alive. I'm only alive if I have that cat's quirk. Nyes roared on the other side of the door. Shoto's voice had melted away, telling Inko that Nyes must be back to normal. Did you want me dead? Like everyone else? Like Bakugo? Like Hitoshi? Are you glad I'm dead? Out of your lives? Screech. Inko turned away and put her hand to her mouth as tears blurred her vision. Nyes started slamming his fists against the door so hard that the door rattled and looked ready to break. Dad gave me another chance. Why can't you? Why can't you see that I just I need that cat's quirk for my own? It's just a cat. I'm the real Izuku. I'm your son. Inko felt herself quake in fear at the aura spilling from the other side of the door. As Nai scratched along the door again. Screech. Mother, I know you hear me. Mother, don't do this to me. Mother, don't do this, please. You're better than the rest. Your mother mother. Inko couldn't take it anymore. She rushed for the window. This window wasn't like the others in the building. It didn't have bars on the window and the window could be opened easily. Inko opened it and slid it open while Nyes continued to scream and pound on the door. Inko popped the screen out and down it fell. The fire escape was just below her. Inko looked around quickly, very quickly, for a weapon. She felt she was going to need one. She found one but it wasn't exactly what she was aiming for as she used her quirk to bring the fork to her. The fork was metal so it could work as ridiculous as it was. Inko then went through the window. The moment she outside she was met with sirens. She looked down and saw a bunch of people outside from police officers, firefighters, ambulances, patients, and nurses, and she saw the heroes rushing inside to help. The wind blew her hair back a little as she did this. Inko licked her lips and rushed towards the stairs. We're almost free, Izuku. Oh, I hope Steven won't be too mad at me and Ko almost wanted to laugh she hadn't even thought of Steven until now. The fire escape clattered with each step she took and she saw a ladder leading up towards the roof. And Ko didn't know what she was thinking. Maybe if Nice couldn't find her he'd just give up. No, she knew she had to go down. She just knew. So, she went down with Izuku against her chest in one hand and the fork clenched tightly in the other. Going down was easy but still made her a bit uneasy as the stairs creaked with every step. It felt like she was going to make it. She was going to make it. The floor under her turned a smoky orange and with no warning, it swallowed her whole, and with a yelp she fell through a sudden tunnel. Inko, for just a moment, was weightless as all she could see was orange. An ungodly shade of orange that hurt her eyes to stare at for too long. Then, in a snap, she was falling through the air and on the ground. Inko braced Izuku as she rolled across the concrete for just a moment before she came to a stop. A breeze swept Inko's hair a bit and she looked around. She was on the roof and she wasn't alone. Nai stood there staring down at her. His eyes dulled as anger made itself known. Next to him was a man who was made of smoke that was orange. The man's eyes were purple as they narrowed at her. Look what you made me do. Nyes whispered. He was dressed in a tank top and gym shorts, certainly not what he was wearing earlier. I had to call Kirajiri to aid me. And Ko looked at Nyes with wide eyes as the boy stepped up to her in a slow and intimidating way, his aura making her shake. This was not her baby. Give me dot 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 that dot 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 fucking cat. Nyes said between tightly clenched teeth. No, and Ko snarled right back and pushed Izuku closer to her chest. I'm your mother. And I said no, she said in the sternest tone she could muster at that moment. Nyes actually blinked in alarm at this as he looked at Kirajiri. Can she do that? She is your mother. Kirajiri shrugged. Nyes let out a little laugh and ran his fingers through his hair. His head was turned away from Inko and Inko could see. The crack across his head, along with the brain that was pulsating. She tightened her grip on the fork. 
Oh well, I guess that's that then do you think I'm stupid? Nice turned back around to scream at Inko. You think by being stern I'll just let you do what you want? You're not in control. I am. So, let me ask again. Do you think I'm stu he never got to finish? There was a blur as Hitoshi kicked Nai's dead in the chest. His wings flapped wildly in Nai's direction causing large gusts of wind to knock Nai's back even farther. Nai's hit the edge of the roof and his arms flailed madly as he tried his hardest to regain his balance. Well, he was saved by Kirijiri, the man making a portal to bring Nai's back to the center of the roof. You suck at using my quirk, Hitoshi growled as he hit the ground. Nai's looked at him and then chuckled. God, you're such an idiot. Then it happened. With a gasp, Inko dropped halfway down one of Kirijiri's portals as did Hitoshi. The only one not in a portal was Izuku as Inko made sure to throw him away from her. Izuku stood and hissed at Nai's. I'm going to make this crystal clear. Either you're coming to me, or I kill them both. Right here, right now. I'll have Kirijiri squeeze them and rip them both in half. Nice threatened Izuku loudly and boldly. As much as I would rather not have blood in my portals, it will be done, Kirijiri added for good measure. Izuku looked at Nice, then he looked at Inko, then at Hitoshi. Both struggled. But Kirijiri's hold was tight. Almost too tight as Inko found it hard to breathe and expand her chest. Hitoshi let out cries as he slapped his hands against the concrete. Don't do it, Moss. Don't. Hitoshi yelled in desperation. It's not worth it. Izuku looked at Hitoshi and trotted over to his friend. Then he rubbed his head against Hitoshi's hand. But, it is. You always were. Izuku said to Hitoshi before he walked away. No. Inko screamed as she reached for her son. Izuku. No. Izuku. Hitoshi tried. God did he try. Inko watched his thrash violently to wiggle free. Izuku Midoriya. I am your mother. Inko shrieked madly. You listen to me this instant young man. You aren't to go to him. It'll be okay. Don't ask me how I know. But, it'll all be okay. I have an angel looking out for us. Izuku told her before he slowly trotted up to Nice. The world felt like it was moving in slow motion as Inko looked past Nice. On the adjacent rooftop, there was a calico cat. A sleek and fluffy calico just watching this all go down. Finally, after all of this time, Nice snatched Izuku up and Inko focused back with horror. He's going to be saved. He has to be saved. She thought as Nice grabbed Izuku tightly around the neck. He held Izuku by the neck and that same black quirk seeped into Izuku's fur. Finally, Nice screamed the quirk transferred into his own body. He's going to be saved. Nice raised Izuku to his mouth and opened his jaws wide. Those sharp teeth were the only thing Inko could see at that moment as Nice clamped his mouth down on Izuku's exposed throat and he tore into Izuku's throat like a savage animal. Blood poured from Izuku's open wound, down his body, and smeared all over Nice's face as he went for a second bite. Izuku's fur. It. It was changing. Not just from the blood but the green was melting away as his fur started to turn white. All white made the blood stand out even more. Then, Nice dropped him. Izuku's body fell to the floor in a bloody splatter. Nice raised his head and started to laugh. Warm. Oh god, I feel so warm. He yelled as looked at his hands. And Ko let out a scream as she reached for her baby. Izuku. Izuku. The cat, once green now white, twitched. It looked like they were reaching for her, but then it went completely limp. Their wounds were too great. And Ko let out another wail that pierced through the air. Izuku. That was twice she failed as a mother. Twice she let her baby die. Itoshi just stared. Then dot 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 he swallowed hard and spoke slowly. Moss was loved by all. And not just by humans. He was loved by cats. A lot of cats. And you pissed them all off. Itoshi yelled at Nice. An army of cats rushed up the fire escape. There were easily over 20 cats hissing and snarling. Leading the charge was a fluffy calico. They jumped Kirijiri. 20 cats jumping a person would throw anybody off. Nice turned an alarm while Kirijiri tried to fight the animals off. Inko and Hitoshi were allowed wiggle room and Inko wasted no time. She charged. The fork was tight in her hand as she rushed Nice's turned head. The crack in his head was growing smaller, but it was still there. You're not my son. Inko screamed right as she thrust the fork straight through Nice's exposed brain. You just have his body. Nice let out an unholy screech as he tried to reach for the fork. Oh, but the cats weren't satisfied. Not until blood was shed for their fallen. A skinny calico, a real skinny one, charged first and jumped on Nyza's shoulder so he couldn't yank the fork out, and she bit into his neck. He went to grab her but a massive orange cat jumped on his other shoulder and started to claw at his face and grabbed his ear in his teeth. The cat yanked hard as the ear started to tear. A black cat joined the battle and jumped on Nyza's back. This black cat helped Inko as he drove the fork deeper into Nyza's healing cavity. The brain couldn't heal, not with a fork wedged in it. Young master, Hirajiri tried to get up, but in an instant. There was an explosion and suddenly Katsuki was up there with them. Katsuki's timing was perfect as he slammed Kirijiri back into the ground. You do have a body. Katsuki yelled and he held Kirijiri to the ground before he raised both hands up, let them heat up, and then clapped both of his hands right against Kirijiri's head. 
A massive explosion caused the man's head to whip up before he fell completely limp. Katsuki focused his sights on Nyes but stopped at what he was seeing. Nyes tried to swipe and get the cats off of him. He screamed in pain and fear as blood poured out of every open wound, as his right ear was completely torn off by the enraged orange cat. There was yowling and screeching as the cats all seemed to scream in bereavement. Nyes backed up desperately trying to free himself then when he was close enough to the edge those on him jumped but not before a brown munchkin and a grey and white cat went behind his legs and under his feet to purposely make Nyes trip and fall over the edge. All of the cats were safe on the roof by the time Nyes fell. There was a scream, a splat, and then, silence. Inko and Hitoshi both slowly looked over the edge of the roof. Their Nyes lay on the ground. The fork poked from the back of his head where Inko had stabbed him and through his left eye socket. His one green eye was completely gone as blood seeped out of the back of his head and made a pool. Inko had to look away as did Katsuki. It felt like it was finally over. Inko looked over at Izuku's body. The real Izuku. The white cat. The other cats were all surrounding it. The lithe black cat was jerking trying to shake the body as if he was trying to wake Izuku up. The orange cat was trying to get the body up by going under it, and the weird calico was pulling on his ear. The large ragdoll calico seemed to be the only one to understand as she looked away, sad as tears actually rolled down her cheeks. She knew, no matter how hard they tried, Izuku wouldn't get up. Not this time. He finally used his last life. Or, Hattie, he's going to come back, Hitoshi told Inko almost confidently. Huh? You can't know that. Katsuki crossed his arms over his chest as he looked away. Besides, unless my ears are wrong, I'm sure Nice took his quirk. Oh, Nice took a quirk all right, Hitoshi said before he smiled. Then in a sudden surprise, his hair poofed up. He had to awkwardly take his ponytail out. His hair was in the air and didn't seem like it was coming back down. I just don't think it was the quirk he thought he took. Notice this. He didn't say he was warm until after he tore into Moss's neck. That's the same as the USJ. So, what about that? Katsuki pointed at Izuku's dead body and Inko had to look away. Let me put it this way, Bakugo, Hitoshi told him sternly. Nyes would still be alive even after the fall if he had gotten Izuku's actual quirk. Are you saying Moss had two quirks this whole time? It's hard to say. Hitoshi sighed and rubbed his head. But he's going to come back one way or another. I promise you. As for your question, I simply don't think the cat's body could handle it anymore. Hitoshi whispered softly. And the thing is, I'm pretty sure Izuku knew this. Think about how lazy he suddenly became, how much weight he gained. I think subconsciously, Izuku knew that this vessel wasn't going to last much longer. Inko was going to pretend like she knew just what was being said. After all dot 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 that was hopeful dot 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 and if there was one thing Inko Midoriya needed right now dot 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 it was hope. Izuku let out a loud sigh as he tilted his head toward the sky. The sky that would forever be just at dusk. Purgatory was silent. A peaceful silence. Izuku kicked his feet over the edge of the building he was sitting on. He smiled to himself and shut his eyes. He had only just come here not that long ago. The sound behind him and Izuku turned before standing up. Nyes let out a pain gag as he collapsed to his knees. He looked pained and Izuku knew just what was happening. The fork still sticking out of Nyes's head as he wobbled with a horrid limp. He was dying. Please. It. It can't end like this. Nyes screamed. I don't. I don't want to go. Tears perked into Nyes's eyes as he grabbed onto Izuku's pants in desperation. Please. I don't. I don't want to die. The light in Nyes's eyes was fading as his grip was slacking. Please. Izuku gently put his hand on Nyes's head. It's going to be okay. Izuku told Nyes in a soft voice. Nyes looked at him, his face still pained. And in a surprising move, he pressed his head against Izuku's stomach. Nyes was starting to fade. Tears fell out of Nyes's good eye as he let out a sob. I don't want to go back into the ground. Those were Nyes's final words before he completely faded from purgatory and any remains would fade away with the wind. Izuku was then alone again. Izuku looked around the roof he was still on. He looked over the edge at his dead body. And then over to the other side where all the dead moss lay. You know, I think it's time to move on from this. Izuku said to himself. It's my purgatory, my mind, and I say I get off of this roof. Izuku grinned as the building faded. The rooftop was gone. His bodies, all of them, faded with this and he sucked in a deep breath and shut his eyes. What do I want? He thought. Where would I want to be? Izuku opened his eyes and smiled at what was greeting him. He was standing in a wide open field. There were all types of wildflowers around him. The air was a nice temperature and on occasion, a cloud would flow by the sun to block it out. Izuku couldn't help himself, he turned in a circle. A butterfly fluttered past him. Izuku reached a finger up and the butterfly landed on his finger. Izuku smiled and sat on the soft grass with his legs under him. Go on, he whispered and gently let the butterfly flutter away like before. Izuku leaned back on his arms and listened to the birds chirping, the grass swaying in the breeze, and the occasional grasshopper. It was the perfect purgatory for him. Mew. Izuku felt a fuzzy head bump against his palm and he looked down at the pure white cat. 
The giant ragdoll jumped on Izuku's lap and rubbed against his chest. Hey, you must be Cloud. Izuku greeted the pure white cat and Cloud jumped on Izuku's shoulder. I take it this means I won't be coming back. Not as you. Cloud let out a mew and pressed his head against Izuku's cheek. You're a good cat, Cloud. Cloud let out a mew before he jumped down and jumped into the grass next to Izuku. He gave Izuku one last look before rushing away from him. Cloud would vanish completely only seconds later. Izuku lay down in the grass and looked at the sky once more. So, you just plan on lazying about. Came a familiar voice as a sleek calico sat next to him. Izuku blinked in surprise and turned onto his side to look at her in full. Angel, the one and only, Angel said as she sat down and got comfortable next to his face. Her fur was soft and warm as it tickled the inside of his nose. What are you? He asked her again and she shrugged. I'm just a street cat. But you aren't exactly in the streets right now. She gave a purr and kept herself pressed next to him. Was I ever? Think about it. Really think about it. Izuku blinked slowly as he listened to her words. But, Pumpkin saw you. Angel gave him another smile as she kept her purr loud. Did he? I don't recall that orange Tom ever looking towards me. Izuku just stared at her and then his eyes softened. You know what? I'm not even surprised. But if you're not even real then, how'd you get Muffin and Pumpkin to come at the end? I know it had to be you. Angel sighed. I can't give away all my secrets, Kit. She told him matter-of-factly with a smile. Just know, I've had my eyes on you this whole time. Only showing when you needed it. Izuku smiled at her. So, why'd you follow me here? Curious, what are you going to do now? Angel inquired and laid down by crossing her paws over one another. Where are you going to go? Your possibilities are endless unless I'm mistaken. I can change into anything. He realized while he looked away from her and then looked up at the sky. Izuku thought about her words and shut his eyes. He thought about Hitoshi, his family, and about Yue and Nenzu. He thought about if he was still needed, if he should just try a whole new life and leave this one behind forever. His life was in his hands now. It could be anything. Izuku smiled and looked at Angel. The calico looked at him and Izuku opened his mouth. Masa's funeral was shocking for those that owned the pet cemetery. The owners expected maybe a kid or even a family, but they most certainly did not expect the whole of UAS staff, including the principal himself, and All Might, the Todoroki family a whole class of students, and more. It was held like an actual funeral. Everyone was dressed in black, some with veils over their faces, while others looked turned away from the plot before them. Of course, those that owned the pet cemetery didn't understand. One a lost one of their own and of course, it was going to be treated seriously. Everyone parted as Hitoshi dressed in a specially made black suit for his wings walked down the way with the tiny cat casket in his arms and tears in his eyes. Hitoshi had told Inko confidently that Izuku was going to come back and he still believed that, but, damn, losing Moss not Izuku Moss didn't really hit him until dot 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 well dot 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 now. He sniffled as he wiped his eyes. He let out a soft cry as he crouched down and gently placed the casket into the plot. He then walked so he was in front of everyone else. Let me say a few words about Moss. He said softly as he wiped his eyes and then looked at Inko Midoriya. The woman was standing beside Stephen and had her head down. His eyes then focused on his own mother. His mom sitting in a wheelchair. Her left leg was braced and splinted and was being held up by the wheelchair. Kikayo Shinsu looked at him before she tipped her head, urging him to continue. All eyes were now on Hitoshi. His fosters all waited for him to continue while his classmates gave him various looks of pity, sadness, and grief. I do not make my past a secret. Hitoshi started as his breath hitched a little. When I was 14 I would often dumpster dive to feed the stray cats. One day as I was feeding these cats I saw Moss standing amongst them. He was the first ever cat I have ever seen to have green fur and little did I know that the moment our eyes locked together my fate was sealed. I can say this with no exaggeration. If it wasn't for Moss, I think I would be dead. Moss was my best friend through thick and thin. When we were homeless and eating out of dumpsters he would often steal from local grocery stores just because he knew her and I needed the food. Moss was more than a cat. He was human to my family and to me most of all. Was he a little spoiled? Yeah. But who doesn't spoil their friends from time to time? Hitoshi sniffled and turned away for a moment to wipe his eyes before he continued. Moss had more lives than I think I could ever count. He's been through so much in the time that I knew him and each and every time he came back. But, Hitoshi pulled out a red carnation from inside of his suit. He reached his limit. Hitoshi raised the carnation up and looked down at the ground as the tears just streamed from his eyes. He put his hand to his eyes and let out a soft cry. This made others cry. He could hear their sniffling and he knew for a fact that Uri and Aburo were at least two of them, maybe Hazashi as well. Tomas, the unofficial member of 1A, and the best damn cat I have ever owned. Other carnations rose into the air as 1A. The teachers, and others, followed suit. Tomas, was the unilateral cry amongst everyone. One by one carnations were thrown inside the hole on top of the casket, so many of them that they completely covered the casket. 
Then the casket was covered with dirt with Hitoshi adding a small bit of dirt from his hand near the very end. All this for a cat. Shush, Natsuo. Hitoshi wanted to smile as he watched Fayumi Todoroki elbow her brother to keep him quiet. Shoto and Toyua wanted us to be here, so be respectful. Hitoshi looked over toward Shoto and Toyua. Both of them were talking to their mother. Endeavor Todoroki was persecuted for child abuse earlier that week and was now being on trial while his status as number one tanked. No doubt they were talking about it and what were to happen next. Heya Hitoshi's leg was nudged and he looked down at his mother. Kikayo had gently nudged his leg with her good leg. That was one hell of a speech, kiddo. Kikayo told him and this made Hitoshi smile at her. Thanks, how's your leg? Kikayo shrugged. It would be better if they gave me some pain meant Hitoshi immediately opened his mouth but his mother shushed him just as quickly. Don't look at me like that. I actually told them not to. This has been the longest I've ever been sober. Can't risk getting hooked again. She told him and Hitoshi nodded before he squatted down so they were at eye level. Kikayo cooed as she put a hand on his cheek. Her hands were cold to the touch. Look at you. You look so much like your father. She gently caressed his cheek with her thumb and Hitoshi leaned into her touch a little. I think you would have made him proud. You think? Well, you've certainly made me proud. She told him. And you're making them proud. She pointed and Hitoshi looked to see her pointing towards his foster parents. And that's all that matters. Kikayo whispered before patting his cheek lovingly. You're doing great, kid. Hitoshi let out a deep breath as his emotions hit him hard and he felt tears spring into his eyes. He quickly wiped his eyes and gave her a watery smile. Thanks, ma. That means a lot. He told her softly and she smiled at him. I know it does. Now, give your mom a hug. I waited 16 years for this. Hitoshi smiled as he and his mother embraced. It was a little awkward as his mom was still in a wheelchair. But it was nice. It was everything he really wanted at that moment and his mother delivered dutifully. It's going to be okay. His mother told him in his ear as they pulled away. It's all going to okay. He knew she was right. Everything was going to be okay. Even without Moss by his side. It was all going to be okay. As a little over a month passed, Hitoshi was up and brushing his teeth. He was in the apartment with the Fosters on this slightly chilly day. He'd be going back to the dorms later that night. Fumikage wanted to watch some movies together and Hitoshi was down for that. Fumikage learned to fly and so it was nice when the two of them would have late night flying sessions together and Hitoshi wondered if Fumikage wanted to do that as well. Things almost seemed to return to normal. Almost. There was still a gap there. The one that Izuku had filled before. Hitoshi truly wondered if his words would come true. As fall was upon them now, he wondered if he'd ever see his friend again. If maybe Izuku had used his last life. Hitoshi capped the toothpaste and sighed while looking at himself in the mirror. He'd been staying in touch with his mother these last four months and, of course, his mother had been staying in touch with Inko. In fact, in a surprising twist, Rei, Inko, and Kikayo all got together and were now owning an apartment together. According to Inko herself, we're all the right amount of crazy and sane to help each other. Inko was also in a relationship with Steven and she was looking a lot better according to Katsuki. It was nice for Hitoshi to see his mother working hard to keep her addiction at bay as it was clear she wanted to stay sober if not for herself then for her friends or her son. Kiddo, Hizashi knocked on the door and Hitoshi opened it. Hizashi was wearing a dress today as he smiled at Hitoshi. Breakfast is ready and on the table, Hizashi told him and Hitoshi smiled. Thanks, Papa. I'll be there in a moment. Hizashi went away to go and get her and Hitoshi smiled. Yes, there was a gap but things were getting better. Hitoshi tucked his wings away on his back and walked out of the bathroom, making sure to turn the light off as he did so. He walked towards the kitchen he heard Shouta's voice how strange. Is it a pet? It has to be, Aburo commented next. It's driving the cats crazy. Shoo. Hitoshi rounded the corner and found the fosters all by the window along with the cats all meowing loudly at their feet. What's up? Hitoshi came up behind them and looked out the window. There was a bird. It was a green macaw that was just chilling on the railing outside. The macaw looked unbothered as it just stared inside the house. It even hopped a little along the railing closer toward the window. Hitoshi's eyes widened a bit as he stared at the bird. Could it be? Hitoshi. Aburo inquired as Hitoshi opened the window slowly. I think it might be. Hitoshi told them before he offered his arm for the bird. It was a green bird that just showed up dot 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 so dot 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 maybe it wasn't out of the question. The bird hopped up to Hitoshi a little cautiously before it gently nudged his arm with its beak and gave a small squawk. After a few more minutes it finally hopped onto his arm and Hitoshi felt his eyes go wide as he pulled the giant maca in. Everyone was staring at this thing with wide eyes and his ashy sucked in a sharp breath when the bird flexed its wings. The bird clicked its tongue a few times. Hello. The bird spoke. H. Hi. Hitoshi whispered as he gently ran a finger down the bird's neck. Their feathers were soft and the bird flapped its wings again. Hi. Izuku. Hitoshi inquired. Izuku. 
The bird repeated happily and everyone's breath caught in their throats. Izuku. The bird calmed down before it hopped onto Hitoshi's shoulder and Hitoshi felt the pressure of tears behind his eyes. Oh god. It's. The door slammed open. I fucking knew it. Vlad all but screamed and this caused the bird to squawk loudly and take off through the window. No. Hitoshi yelled but it was too late. The maca was gone. Asshole. Hitoshi turned his ire towards Vlad. Easy, Hitoshi. Shouta sternly told his son before focusing on Vlad. What on earth were you thinking? What did you know? Where's the fire? What did I know? What did I know? I knew that your cat may he rest in peace fathered my fairy's babies. And now I demand child support. Vlad yelled. Vlad, there's no way. I've seen the kittens, they're all black and white. Shouta huffed and leaned against a wall and crossed his arms over his chest. It's not possible. Then why is one green Vlad never got to finish as Hitoshi literally flew past the teacher? And without a care in the world, he opened the door and walked inside of Vlad's apartment. It didn't take long for the black and white cats to take an interest in him, namely his shoelaces, but Hitoshi ignored them. The first time in his life he ever ignored kittens wanting to play with him. He found the kitten that Vlad was referring to. There, next to his mother lay a black cat only what was interesting was that the patches that should be white were green in color. His mother was furiously washing his feet trying to get the green off of him. All of his paws were green. His chest and underbelly were also green and he had a green mask over his right eye. Hitoshi squatted down and smiled. The kitten saw him, perked, and sat up immediately. He was so little and Hitoshi felt like an idiot. There was no way Izuku would be a fully grown Makaw in just a month. Hitoshi kept that smile on his face as he spoke. Welcome back, buddy. 